World Surf League Championship Tour migrates to South Africa. A spectacular landscape of wonder and wildlife. A place where kings and queens battle for dominance and fight for survival. A crown jewel of the African continent, Jeffreys Bay hosts surfing's royalty in the penultimate stop of the 2023 season. The Corona Open J Bay. The race to the Rip Curl WSL Finals is narrowing, and with their wins in Brazil, Caitlin Simmers and Yago Dora shook up the rankings. Carissa Moore and Tyler Wright have punched their tickets to trestles, but the pressure is building for the newcomers trying to hang on and superstars trying to get in. Only two events remain to clinch a spot in the final five. The hunt for the Rip Curl WSL Finals continues at the Corona Open J Bay. It's a brilliant afternoon. World number three, Caroline Marks, checking in and looking at the surf, along with world number one with her husband, Luke. Liking what she's seeing in this lineup for the opening round, a two-time world champ and someone who's clinched her spot in the Rip Curl WSL Finals. Tyler Wright preparing for a big day, along with Sarah Baum, fresh off a quarterfinal finish in Belito. Number eight on the Challenger Series, has a big wild card opportunity today. And Joanne DeFay, Enjoying the wildlife here at Jeffrey's Bay. We go on safari on land, and how about this? A beautiful whale just enjoying this afternoon and getting a great seat to watch the world's best perform here at the best right-hand point break in the world. Thanks for being with us. I'm Joe Turpel. This is Richie Lovett, a man that knows how to make finals day at Jay Bay. Well, we've had a series of lay days. Excited that we're getting things going again today. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, We've had a couple of days off, a few rounds of golf, a little bit of surfing, and just generally easing into it, but excited to get things started. You were in the water, Richie, just on that break through a series of holds. Uh, what are you yep. liking about conditions today? Uh, there's, some, uh, there's a building swell. You can definitely feel it. It's a little bit inconsistent, but there's waves out there, and the winds turn perfect. So it's a beautiful day, sunny, nice and warm. I'm excited. Let's so now chat to a couple of legends standing by. AJ McCord is with Travis Logie. That's right. It is a beautiful day here in J Bay. Even better when we get the news from Travis Logie. Give us the official call. Yeah, AJ, we're back on after three glorious lay days. We're back to work, but the waves are super fun. Swell's come up big time since yesterday. Some fun three to four sets. It is a little bit inconsistent, so we've gone back to 40-minute heats for those three surfer heats. And so we're going to do women's opening round followed by women's elimination round. Uh, looks like a great day ahead. Jay Bay is just such an iconic break. Those right-handers just go forever. What is it about the waves and the swell today that you're looking for in terms of how the women can shred him? Yeah, well, we have a building swell today, so we should have seen some improvement in the swell while we're, while we're out there. And it's just high-performance surfing, which we love to see in Jay Bay. Maybe mixed in with the odd barrel as the swell picks up. Um, and then the next couple of days, too, look incredible. So we, we should have a crazy finish. Cannot wait for it. We'll get it started by sending it back to you guys in the booth. Exciting. Thanks so much, AJ. Travis Logie is so good at his job. Uh, he was great at his job when he was on tour competing in the title race. And he knows so much about this beautiful place, knows what's left in the event. And seeing some more consistency after a few holds, happy to get some work done with the opening round for the women. Elimination round still on deck as well. And also a big thanks to Surfline for giving us the forecast for our waiting period. And we know we're on the brink of seeing some bigger surf over the next couple of days. But they definitely pinpointed this day as a potential run day. Stoked we're on with some sunshine. Yeah, absolutely. We've been, uh, all of us, we all watch the charts. Uh, in particular, obviously, Trav and the, and the crew at the WSL are looking at it very, very closely. But we knew today was going to be a little sleepy at the start. Uh, but then by this afternoon, we feel like the sets are really going to start to fill in. And we're going to see a much stronger swell as of tomorrow and into Wednesday. Uh, potentially finish. Who knows? We'll see. Uh, Thursday still looking okay as well. So for the next four days, you can see here Tuesday right up there. We're starting to get you know overhead conditions. Uh, the wind's looking really good offshore. Potentially a little bit of sideshore in the afternoon. But honestly, when you when you get this far down the point. 
the wind is just groomed. Second wave of the set is always silky smooth. Uh, so the exciting thing, Joe, we've got plenty of action, plenty of waves on the horizon the next two days. Really cool to see that. So just to let you know, it is Monday here in South Africa. Tomorrow, Tuesday is when things pick up. So I think we'll be pretty busy from here on out. Thanks for hanging in there with us on the lay days. The surfers have been traveling a little bit up and down the coast to find even different surf spots to make sure their equipment was ready to go. The top of the point at Boneyards offers some waves on some of those flatter days and also trying to mix it up a little bit with some safaris. I know Caitlin Simmers went on one with her family uh, in the last few days. Molly did that right away with her mom. It seems like a family event. You know, as soon as uh, these surfers qualify for the tour, family members are signing up to make the trek with them to South Africa. Yeah, it's one of those really special places where you, there's so much to see and do. There's obviously, you know, the world, one of the world's best right-handers that we get to compete on and, and call all the action. But again, as you said, Joe, there's so much to do. And obviously the safaris are, are, a, are a big hit. Not too far away from where we are here down at Jeffreys Bay. Just a couple of hours drive and you'll see the big five. Exactly, Molly Picklum representing a top seed in this seat. Won her first event of her career at Sunset Beach this year. Lost uh, kind of uncomfortably early for her standards at pipe because she was really willing to send it on some big waves. One wave came in her heat. She went on it, packed it, and she had to shake it off with a free surf at sunset, which ended up benefiting her role at the next event on the calendar. Got a great win, even wore yellow this season for the first time in her career. It's an interesting prospect, isn't it, of having that yellow jersey and then you actually lose it and then you want to get it back again <laughs> because that, that there would be a certain amount of um, pressure that comes along with wearing that jersey. And, uh, you know, Molly's just showing incredible maturity for someone who's only been on the tour a couple of years now. Molly Picklam fans at home in Terrigal, they're comfortably watching just past 8 p.m. there as we see the first wave of the day goes to Gabriella Bryan. Looking intent to throw down some power. That's what she's famous for. Perfect timing off the lip. Floats the next section. Brian jams it again. Little two for one bonus to hammer in the maneuver count. Super strong competitor. Rookie of the year last season. Her fans watching back home on the island of Kauai are staying up late just past midnight over there in the Hawaiian Islands as we check out the replay of the opener of the afternoon. Yeah, she was quite deep, Joe, but uh, not a bad way to start off the women's event here at Jeffreys Bay, streaking down the line. One thing, Joe, it is super fast when it's this size, breaks right along that rock shelf. You have to time these maneuvers to perfection, so I like the way Gabriella finished that ride. Look here at the slow motion. She's, uh, the way she's hitting these maneuvers, she's not over committing. Just keeping the front of that board directed down the line, maintaining that speed. You can see well, she wasn't over surfing it. She wasn't trying to really overextend and do something too radical uh, that was going to potentially put her in a situation where she could fall off. You could see the intent was just get a ride on the board. And that's, uh, it's going to be crucial today because this inconsistency, every ride is going to count. And uh, I'm really interested to see at these opening stages of the heat as well, the positioning where our surfers are going to really push for that inside or whether they're going to push their competitors up the point to potentially, you know, put them too far. There's a, there's a bit of a chess match that uh, happens at the start of each and every heat. Chatting to Joel Parkinson moments ago, he said he really likes the angle of this swell today. He said it is a touch small, but he enjoyed a lot of days like this in his career. One of the greats that competed out here for many years, including his most important win when he was getting started as a Gromit. 1999 champ as a wild card, still 18. Not everyone accomplishes that instant connection with Jay Bay. Their first trip, turning it into a win. I mean, the stories are always like, you've got to put time in. You've got to figure out where to do your turns. For some people, they have a, a direct connection, and that's really what Caitlin Simmers and Molly Picklam are trying to accomplish. You know, they weren't here last year, so they're in their first appearance in this event. Let's see if they can do it. Parker did. Yeah, absolutely. It's the most perfect, imperfect way to surf <laughs> because it's, you know, it looks like a dream when you're on the on the shore and you're looking at it. 
but when you ride the wave, it's there is a riddle to it. Um, your, your timing has to be perfect. Your flow has to be perfect. And like you said, that you need to connect with it. Um, and for me, all the greats have an incredible bottom turn as they approach their manoeuvres. Uh, the bottom turn's drawn out a little bit more, especially when it gets bigger. Uh, but there's all these little moods and sections that, that tend to happen, especially when it's smaller like this. And, and when it's this size, I feel like it's even more difficult to surf. Yeah, there's the speed of the wave and trying to max out your maneuvers. Definitely always looking for quality. Gabby Bryan gets on the board with a 5.67. So that's the opener. Now with third priority. Molly and Caitlin still waiting so they could just out position each other on the point. But Brian would probably be happy with that start, getting a number and uh, inconsistent heat. It's a great accomplishment. Yeah, it's. Uh, it, I thought it was a well-surfed wave. I, th I think that's a, a good score. The scale has been set. So again, we break down the replay here. Gabriella Bryan, she's got eyes on the lip here. Look at where she's looking. Now she just snaps out of the lip there. Beautiful spray. You can see engaging the, the inside rail of that board straight back up into this next section, kind of coming from behind it, but manages to uh, keep the board projecting down the line. Jams on the tail there, quick check snap. She cut that one short so that she could get to this final closeout maneuver and looking very confident and sturdy on her feet. Such a solid competitor, such a hard worker to get where, where she is today. And a heart of gold after she won Rookie of the Year last season. She showed up at a local event at PK's on the island of Kauai. Lived like Sign Gromfest, gave away a surfboard to a lucky kid, and everyone was just in awe of her presence, knowing that she had a stellar season against the best in the world, and she was already inspiring the next generation back home. That means a lot to her, because she had a series of legends to look up to from her home island, you know, from Rochelle Ballard to Kayla Kennelly and beyond. So she was happy to give back to the next generation after a busy year on tour. As we check out this beautiful sunshine on this afternoon, these fans have been really lucky through the lay days. They got to watch Wimbledon on the beach yesterday on the Jumbotron. They had the rugby on the day before. So all these fans have had a lot to do on the beach, just real peacefully grabbing a chair, and I don't know how many people can say they watch Wimbledon from the bricks <laughs> at Jeffrey's Bay. Yeah, it's incredible, isn't it? And uh, there's a number of Corona bars situated along the point as well, and plenty of people taking in all the atmosphere. And the weather has just been absolutely incredible the last couple of days. It must be, you know, 20 odd degrees outside right now. Some of our competitors there just coming in from the warm up surf. Yeah, enjoying the Red Bull athlete zone. With the jacuzzi there, that's crucial. On the cold mornings right now, it's just a treat. They're just enjoying the action. Men called off for the day, just to let you know, and they're not going anywhere. Great seat to watch pro surfing from the jacuzzi there. Oh, it's, it should be called the Red Bull Athlete Resort because that <laughs> setup is absolutely perfect. Ice baths, saunas, spas, it's catered, it's the food nonstop all day long. Uh, beautiful couches, TVs where they can check out all the action, but um, yeah. Our surfers not going very far. All the men down here to watch the women, uh, they're always uh, sort of simulating, I guess, their own performance out there in a heat situation, watching the conditions, mind surfing a lot of the time. Oh, certainly. And you can see the beautiful homes right here on the point at Jeffreys Bay. There's some famous ones. We always talk about Sharon's house. She's been hosting so many people that come here, not just the best in the world that are on tour, but the next generation as well. There's all these young little groms they get to hang out at Sharon's. They're well fed. They can go walk out to the keyhole, surf all day. So it wasn't just for Aki and Louis Egan back in the day. It's, it still continues as she hosts some of the luckiest kids in the world. I think they know how lucky they are as well. Oh, yeah. I mean, Sharon and what she's done for, for surfing in this town can't be understated. As we now will see an opener and a little pull into the tube for Caitlin Simmers. Her family back home watching in Oceanside. It's already past three in the morning, staying up late. Loves to pull into barrels. Great specialist in slabs. We saw her run over to the slab in West Oz in between heats. And surfers don't have to do that. You know, they're preparing for main break. But that pure surfer in her loving to get barreled is what's making everyone so excited about this rookie on tour. Yeah, absolutely. She's got. Uh She's got that courageous heart in her, doesn't she, where she really wants to challenge herself and improve. 
We see the replay here. So this is uh, this is Katie's first wave at J Bay in a competition jersey, and really didn't have too much option but to pull in. I think it's a risky move today, Joe, at the moment, unless it's a, a very clear barrel. Um, but at this at this size, it tends to pinch a little bit. Very sectiony. I think today is all about getting enough speed, enough space to get out on the face, do your manoeuvres, continue on down the line. So instantly, uh, Katie's put herself in a little bit of a difficult situation because she's gone down into the third priority on the order and hasn't got a score to her name. So Gabriella Bryan, that 5.67, looking better and better with each minute that passes down. Still plenty of time on the clock, though, 30 minutes. That's right. Caitlin Simmers getting her first wave out of the way. Let's get some more insight on Katie with AJ. Joe, I got a chance to catch up with Tommy Whitaker, her coach, just before she went in the water. And so, obviously, as a rookie on tour, this is her first time competitively surfing at J Bay. There hasn't been a ton of swell in the water for her to practice on. But he said for every single stop, since it's a brand new one, she's just treating it as an adventure and going out there and making the most of whatever the waves are that are provided to her. And I got a chance to ask him a little bit more about her equipment. She's riding 5'4", pretty normal board for her. So to get a little bit more insight on that board and what it's going to do for Katie out in the lineup. Let's head over to Strider Wazlewski. Thank you, AJ. Yeah, so, you know, the boards she brought, the very standard, the boards that she's been riding a lot of. She's actually got six boards here. She's got a couple of 5.4s, a couple of 5.5s, five and all the way up to 5.7, hopefully for those bigger swells that come through. They're a tri-fin set up with a, a round pin. With that, all the other athletes kind of riding the same thing out there on a 5.10, a little bit more length. Um, right now for Bryant, she's got a nice 5.10 tri-fin round pin tail as well, and then Pickles is out on a, a 5.10. 5-8 round pin tri-fin setup. So pretty stock standard, really drivey surfboards as this wave. You want to get down the line and go really fast, and then you can rip into the lip, and that's what these boards are set up for. Good man, Waz. We're seeing that 5-4 in motion, shaped by Borst Designs down in San Diego. She's been enjoying those boards for a few years now. She's been loving the attention to detail. All focus from Borst just on Caitlin Simmers on tour, so she gets all the attention that she deserves to compete in the title race. And comes in to stop number nine, already with two wins this season. And we'll take another look. Second effort for Caitlin Simmers in heat number one. Yeah, great pickup here. Katie just flying down the line. I love that snap, Joe. Really quick, kind of tweaked it out just ever so slightly. And then a great finish. So the two-turn combination. And uh, typically, when you think of Jeffrey's Bay, you think multiple turns. But these are two decent right, uh, turns here that Katie does here. And I like this final hit. Times it to perfection. Up on the lip. And just navigating through that explosion as uh, she finds that connection to the face again. Would you say the round tail would be the most common choice here for Jeffrey's Bay? I think so, for sure. Um, I'd say 80%, maybe even more, 90% of the... The surfers on tour would have that uh, rounded pin or that sort of round tail. Uh, but interesting, in, interestingly, Stephanie's gone to a, a more of a square tail for this event. Um, most of her boards, that rounded square, even quite a, um, you know, an angular square. We can get into that a little bit later. I like that. We'll focus on the round tail. Why would you Let's say that. that's the most common? Uh, I, I feel like a round tail is just very smooth from rail to rail, and that's happening a lot when you really gunning down the line here at Jeffreys Bay. It also allows the, the back half of the board just to sink into the wave face just a little bit better. Uh, you think of that extra corner on the square tail, it's sort of lifting the tail ever so slightly out of the water as well. That's why they're typically better in, in smaller ways and that's the go-to tail shape for more beach break conditions. But at a point break like this, uh, that down the line speed ever so crucial. Gabriella Bryan on wave number two. Just chasing, winds up, clean carve on the open face, over the lip with a solid connection and shuts it down again. Gabriella Bryan is understanding the pace here at this size of Jeffreys Bay. Really hard to accomplish all those maneuvers. So a job well done. Remember her opener, five, six, seven, building her lead with that second effort. What a pickup. And uh, perhaps that wave just wasn't quite big enough for Molly Picklam to really make the commitment to it. But uh, Gabrielle O'Brien said, well, if you don't want it, I'm going to take it. 
little bit further up the point, streaking down the line here. Building speed. Watch this turn. Quick snap. Carves down the face. Another quick snap and then gets to that third, that closeout manoeuvre. So a series of strong turns here. I love that carve down. Straight onto that toe side rail and uh, putting an extra little bit of flair into that snap. Kicks the fins out. Great angle here where we can actually see the tail of the board. Come out the back of the wave and then finishes strong. So uh, great start here from Gabriella Bryan. She's going to uh, back up that first score. Brian's still looking for her first CT win of her career. She's had a final in the past. It was a crucial one in her rookie season. Back at Margaret River to survive her first chance at the midseason cut. The lone rookie survivor last season. So she came extremely close and kind of in a very youthful heat when you really think about it. About 40 events when you look at the cumulative total for these three athletes. So it kind of brings up the conversation. Are we seeing a changing of the guard this year, Richie. When you look at the last 15 years of pro surfing on the women's side, it's really three names. Steph Gilmore, Carissa Moore, Tyler Wright as owning yep. pro surfing. Are we going to see that change? I mean, focusing on this pack we have in the water right now. I think it's undeniable, really, when you when you look at what's going on on the tour and even, you know, the last couple of seasons, some of the, the greats that you uh, spoke about, namely Stephanie, you know, is, has almost struggled to kind of maintain her position on tour but when she did she was uh you know stamped her authority but really you know this is the, this is the new breed of women surfer that we're seeing in this heat right now katie simmers has uh, already clocked up a couple of big wins in her career obviously molly as well and uh, gabrielle bryant she's building working a little bit more with uh, richard dog marsh i believe taking on the uh well very wise and uh Long-time surfer, Richard Dogmarsh. He's worked with so many great surfers over the years. And I was chatting to him early. We'll get back to that, because here goes Molly. Molly Picklum being the most patient. Throws down her first turn off the lip. Throws down a healthy-looking carve, and that's going to put her behind. So she'll settle for a two-turn combination. Caitlin Simmers, remember, pulled into the barrel, went down, but then improved to a 5-3-3. And then Brian just improved to a 7.0. So I think Molly kind of felt the sense of urgency there to just start surfing. Was able to kind of save that first turn and then really grease the second carve quite well. Yeah, so let's see what happened here. The first turn, she just got a little bit caught up, maybe in two minds and that big wrap there. So potentially overcommitted on the wrap. Even though it was right through to the inside, there may have been one more turn on that wave. So this first turn here, I feel like Molly was almost in two minds whether to go for that big layback hack or just do that clean snap and, and continue on down the line. This second turn, it is really polished though. Big wrapping carve. But uh, you can see there, it's just, it's millimeters from the difference between getting on down the line and, and maintaining your position in front of this wave when you overcommit like that, when it's uh, this size, you can be left behind so easily. Be interesting to see the message from the judges on how they react to Picklum's wave. When you have the speed for a two-turn combo, but if they see that you're not surfing the entire wave, you've missed opportunity, oftentimes you'll see the score squashed a bit. Yeah, well, her, the final finishing move was arguably the biggest turn of the heat so far, the single turn. But just the way that the wave was constructed, I think the judges will, will uh, perhaps just show a little bit of restraint there. But I uh, was just chatting to Micro, and, and she said that last year Molly came down and surfed J-Bay after the Belito event, even though she wasn't on the tour. Uh, she came down and she wanted to get more reps, knowing that you know she would be back on tour one day. Uh, just wanted to understand the, the wave a little bit more, which shows great commitment. So we just break down this turn a little bit there. So, yeah, just got a little stuck on the heelside rail there, but then tidies it up beautifully as she comes into this turn. You can see that big wrapping carve. Beautiful technique there. And then uh, just here as she gets back on the, the toe side rail and through that transition, just got stuck a little bit behind. That's probably my favorite thing that Picklum does, that big open yep. face hook, that carve where Caitlin and Gabby have had big eights in the past. Molly's had the best single score on the CT. That was a 9-1-7 when she beat Tyler Wright. 
over at Margaret River, throwing down an aggressive front side down carve. So she's got the power, she's got great technique when she lets go of that rail. And her numbers will be dropping in 5.07, third position at the moment. Caitlin Simmers second, Gabby Bryan in first. It's all about heat wins here in the opening round. Second and third are reseeded in the elimination round, which is so far on deck for later on today. And first place reseeded straight to the quarterfinals. With now 20 and a half to go. Great to see the conditions here this afternoon. Gabby Bryan setting the pace with a seven point ride and a five, six, seven. We'll be right back. The Corona Open J-Bay is brought to you by Corona, this is living. By Sealand, discover new paths. And by Kuga Municipality, good governance through service. You're watching the opening round of competition. Gabby Bryan out front, Caitlin Simmer still second, and Molly Picklum in the third spot. Joe Chappelle with Richie Lovett, who's surfed in over 100 championship tour events around the world and enjoying this sunny afternoon. Inconsistent a bit on the sets, but still very contestable for this afternoon. Looking to finish this round and the elimination round before the sun goes down tonight. Gabby Bryan in a great position in her career, getting some great backing when she qualified for the tour, did damage on the Challenger Series without a major sponsor, and getting some great surfboards from Matt Biolis, who's been dominating the Vistla CT Shaper nice. rankings with some crucial final appearances, some big wins. Obviously, he's got number one in the world, Carissa Moore, that always gets him a lot of points. Three wins this season. Talked about a start this year with Sharp Eye kind of doing a great job. Jack Robinson winning Pipe, Toledo at Sunset. It was almost looking like Sharp Eye was going to get a jump start to the CT Shaper rankings. And now Mayhem in the driver's seat coming into stop number nine. Taking off on this wave is Molly Picklum from Terrigal, New South Wales. Wrap and kicks out immediately. So not much happening there. That should be a throwaway here in this opening round. But interesting, Richie mentioning her trip last year to Jay Bay to get a warm up for this season. That was right after a big win in Bolito. Crucial result, they got her back on tour. But the story behind that win is just unbelievable, where Mike Rowe, her coach, and herself were having just a warm-up, little practice session, and she could not land a single turn. It was a baffling moment for herself as, you know, one of the best surfers in the world, but also her coach. You know, Glenn got on the phone, talked to his wife, and said, I don't know what's going on. He said, okay, why don't you go out and just do a floater? Let's just start there. Then she couldn't do it. It was just a crazy feeling she had and talk about being the best in the world and she just could not do a single maneuver and as the story goes Glenn as expected suggested a different game called golf one he loves 
brought her on the golf course, and it was just she needed to leave the beach. She needed to just get out of there for a second. She was overthinking everything. Yeah. And just when she was able to put her mind on something else, as challenging as golf, it gave her this fresh new look at what she was doing, went on to, to win the entire contest. And talk about it, turn around, and also for a coach, an understanding of what Molly really needed to do, and that actually was not surfing at that moment of her career. Wow, that's that's really cool, and uh, and you know, hats off to Micro for actually identifying that it was a because a, ultimately it's a mental issue, right? It would, you know, the fact that she was just having a bad day on the board, you know, doesn't really reflect or doesn't reflect of you know anything to do with her talents. It was just you know the headspace she was in, but uh, a lot of surfers taking on golf as uh, their second sport and it's a very challenging one at that and then you can see the parallels between them um, you know no two shots the same no two waves are the same um, and it's you against uh, you know you against your environment so uh, as we see here micro just chatting with Lakey he was saying that Lakey's in the, the best performance or best you know setup and, and preparation she's ever had really happy with where she is at and uh, well micro and he little fell up, but he's got a lot of big knowledge. A man who's also won in Bolito yeah, years back, beat Nathaniel Kern in the final. We ended up chairing Micro around the town that evening. <laughs> As we look at this one, Gabrielle Bryan up and out. Yeah, I was lucky enough to sit down with Molly Picklam on a one on one, a series that's on WorldSurfLeague.com. You can check that out after the event today. Really cool personality, super funny. Just enjoys her travels around the world, has her mom here for some great support. But just keeps it light, keeps it fun, loves her sport. Loves pushing herself. Almost won Bells this year. And she had a really cool final with, with Tyler Wright. Had a lot of media responsibilities. Returning to Australia, number one in the world. As you see how her season got started, quarter final at Pipe, I think that's an event she could win one day. Also, Sunset Beach getting the win over Caroline Marks in the final. Runner up at Bells Beach. Then we saw a little bit of a slide, but then we kind of got wind of a, a little back injury that she's been really trying to work out each and every day. Saw her doing that at the Surf Ranch, just trying to keep things light. And gosh, a sore back, that is really tough to perform when you're dealing with that. Yeah, absolutely. I've had my own issues with back, uh, you know, strains and things. I uh, actually had a, blew a disc out a couple of years ago and had oh. that operated on. So, uh, you know, the backs are, are for surfers, you know, it's that hinging. It's that real critical area of the body that you need to look after. And the best way to do that is to have a really strong core um, to sort of offset uh, all the strain that happens. But yeah, um, I, getting back to what you're saying, Molly almost reminds me a little bit of Sally, just how into her sport she is, and her fitness. She's always upbeat and very happy. So we see Sarah Baum heading out. Big heat for her coming up. 100% Sarah Baum, number eight on the Challenger Series. She has a big heat with two of the best at J Bay, Chris Amore, a past champion. Lakey Peterson has been in two finals out of three previous starts. But that's what wild cards are supposed to do. Go against the big names on tour and change that script around. When you think of Jay Bay, you think of wild card stories. You always think of Sean Holmes and what he did to the best in the world, like Kelly, like Andy. And he was always so apologetic in his interviews. But he was undeniable with his local knowledge at Jay Bay. For Sarah Baum, she comes out of Durban, but she's been residing in Newcastle these days. And a ton of experience as she's coming up next. Yeah, she's got some big turns too. So uh, she can find a couple of set waves. She's really going to push these other competitors. Just makes sense that Lakey's had so much success at this wave growing up at Rincon in Southern California. Cool water wax going on there. I think Joe. Um, most of the competitors having a hard base, but then using a very soft, tacky, uh, just top coat because the water is uh, quite cold. When we arrived, it was uh, it was actually pretty good, nice, very comfortable in a three-two. 
but it's dropped a couple of degrees the last few days and the four threes come out. It got colder. Yeah, it got really cold. But that's usually a good sign when you have colder temperatures here at Jeffreys Bay. You kind of can tell that swell is on the way. Predicted to get a bit bigger tomorrow and the next day, so we're anticipating big days of competition. All the safaris are going to be put on hold. All the trips up and down the beach, all the trips to St. Francis to play some golf. Everyone's uh, nice and ready to compete now. Gabby Bryan happy with her quick start when you look at the time left. Five, six, seven on the opener right into a seven point ride. Picklam has moved to second. Caitlin Simmers to third. Simmers fresh off her second win of her career. Winning in beach breaks so far this season. Yeah, uh, look, you, you know, She's been surfing so well out here. Been watching closely on the on the warm-ups, and she's just got that really fast, quick down the line style. And she's bringing a, a new flair to the type of maneuvers that she's doing. And uh, but it's Gabrielle O'Brien out in front, and she has executed Richard Dog Dog Marsh's plan to an absolute T. I was chatting to him just before the heat as well, and he said, "I want her to control the heat. Really strong start. Make sure she backs it up." Because it's so inconsistent, if you can put that pressure on your competitors early on in the heat, and she's done just that with two strong rides, she's going to be in a good place here. So this would, uh, she does maintain that first position. It's going to be a good start for Gabrielle. Thinking about a really cool heritage sheet to watch with their coaches. All three Aussie coaches, Glenn Micro Hall, Tommy Whitaker, Richard Dog Marsh. Who's your pick there? Uh, let's throw Louis Egan out there as well. Oh, we could, yeah. We could. I mean, just in this heat, though. I mean, that's pretty impressive. Yeah, no, I'd, uh, I'll go with my little tour mate, Tommy Whitaker. I had a feeling. I had a feeling. Tommy Whitaker, a master of a lineup, understands how to play the game, gets his athletes excited about being involved in this dream tour, doesn't ever take the shine off it, reminds you how lucky you are to be here. He balances the hard work and, and the joy of the tour so well, doesn't he? He really does, and just one of the most positive people you want to be around. And, and a lot of the time, that's a coach's job, is to bring those good vibes, get that positive affirmation going all the time, reinforcing you know, what's good, what we need to work on, everything's positive. Camp more, just getting ready. Carissa's having one of those special years like we've seen from her so many times, a five-time world champion. Winning this event a couple of years back. Horty with three big wins this season. Chasing a sixth world title this year, already guaranteed to be at lower trestles. We still have to work out seating for Riss to see if she'll be in yellow for the third straight year in a row. Heading into the Rip Curl WSL Finals. Still a little bit of work to do, isn't there? Even though she's made it, it's very important. She'll be wanting to, to go through in that top position. Looking good in uh, the yellow jersey, no doubt. And uh, I, I think she's possibly been one of the women who has surfed the most. Uh, always in the lineup, always practicing. Um, I've seen her out here more than any of the other any of the other women, I think. Even on those days that yep. are deemed flat conditions, you see wrists just find a section to do a turn, to stay fresh. I talked to her and her husband Luke the other day. They're not, you know, signing up for any safaris. She's just staying in her flow until the job's done. Yep. She likes her routine. She doesn't want to remove her mindset from what she wants to accomplish here. It's been a great opportunity for all the fans, uh, all the South African fans to come down, get up close and personal with their favorite surfers. There's been so many people. That's one thing that I've noticed, Joe, um, over the last couple of days and not having been back to J-Bay for almost 20 years, is just the amount of people that have been coming down to the event and enjoying everything that's going on around it. Plenty of kids coming down, looking for autographs. So much to see and do down here. Oh, it's so true. Chris has had so much time for all the local kids. Taking them surfing the other day. And she's preparing up there. Up by the bricks for a heat with Lakey and Sarah Baum coming up next. Meanwhile, it's still Gabby Bryan out in front of this one. With six minutes to go, here's the recap. We saw Gabby get the first wave of the heat. Then Caitlin Simmers opened up. Her best wave so far in a jersey at Jeffreys Bay. 
comes in at a 5.33. And Brian just hasn't lost her lead yet. 5.67 into a 7.0. Oh, I love that turn, that little carve down into the quick snap. Gets the release and finishes off. So great wave there. This is Molly Picklam. She's got a nice carve as well. A beautiful finishing turn. A lot of that 5.07 came off the back of that final carve. You can see Gabriella Bryan is keeping the feet moving, keeping the, the blood flowing. You can uh, start to seize up a little bit when you sit around. Fair uh, amount of time between the sets, Joey. So you really got to be ready to fire once those sets do arrive. But I think the difference at the moment is that Gabriella Bryan's been able to identify and find those waves, offering a little bit more down the line, a bit more to them offering up those uh, extra opportunities. Oh, it's such a terrible feeling when your feet go numb on you and you try to perform, you can't really feel your equipment. So smart for Gabby just to give herself a quick massage, keep the blood flowing. A lot of times these surfers don't want to put on booties because it's a drastic change to the traction that they feel. And in the heat, they'll just go, okay, I want to keep connection with the surfboard. We saw Gentile go for booties. He feels comfy enough to perform on it, the CT level and heats. But for a majority of the season, they're, they're not wearing them. So you can see why they just go, you know what? We'll be all right. As this next heat is preparing for the keyhole, which has provided us a lot of entertainment in the past. Oh yeah. it's uh, And when the tide's a little bit lower like this, you can actually skirt out on the rocks there right to the top of the keyhole and let's just take a mental note here so Carissa's the first to get in the water here let's see where she positions herself for the start of this next heat in relation to the other competitors always oh, such a big part of the matchup who demands the deepest part of the wave to start off the heat when there's no priority and obviously on this right hand point break someone can just go all the way up to boneyards but you're always balancing of going too deep and being left behind. But it's the coolest thing to watch, just who's gonna demand that. Riss coming up next, Lakey Peterson, Sarah Baum. Important heats for Stephanie Gilmore and Tatiana Weston Webb as well as they're tied just outside of the final five. Weston Webb defending event champ. This is heat three, Gilmore heat four today. Some great surfing coming your way and some big heats too. Um, you know, Steph's a, it's a huge event for her. You know, you think about, uh, you know, that she's tied there with Tatiana, but you, know, you feel like for that final event at Tahiti, Tatiana's going to be very comfortable on her forehand, being the goofy footer. Stephanie uh, would be thinking, okay, this is where I want to get my work done. I want to try and put things to bed here. Steph's warm-ups have looked great. She had a fun one this morning as well. Trying out a new board. We'll see what she ends up riding in a couple of heats from now. 2.40 on the clock, and it's all about just Gabby Bryan being really aggressive at the start. And backed it up with a 7, which is still the best number of the afternoon. Back of the line of priority, but feeling no pressure. And Caitlin Simmers... Might just be waiting for one more wave, a 7-3-4 to go straight into first. Surfer that made the famous call of not accepting her rookie debut a couple years back because she wanted to do some more surfing and grow a little bit. That opened up the spot for Molly Picklam, who's in the water now. So Picklam got the late call up when she thought she was one spot out of qualifying. Picklam accepted it, worked through the first five events went back to the challenger series saw katie simmers there again and simmers easily got back on tour and katie had a lot of heats with gabby bryan including a u.s open final a couple years back so this generation seen a lot of each other in some big heats in the past and down to 90 seconds a couple of little lines coming through simmers might have a chance here Famous for a solid ability above the lip. That was uh, the story of opening day for the men. Simmers might have to rely on it if she has a closeout section heading her way. Yeah, it's a uh, limited opportunity sometimes, and the only thing you, you can really do to get that big score is to take it above the lip. And uh, she's one of the, the women who has that in her repertoire. 
And I think we're going to see a draw on that more and more as uh, we see her career unfold. Gabriella Bryan should be feeling good about this. Hoping the ocean doesn't produce anything. Well, it's such a difference from a first and a second in this opening round. I mean, you win this seat, you're getting at least a quarterfinal result. You know, this is all post-cut format with a smaller tour. So you kind of have to bring the energy like this is a final. It's such a big difference from elimination round heat. Every result counts once we get past Margaret River. So starting at the surf ranch, if you lose early, you're keeping that score. and It's affecting if you'll be in the title day. It's September at the Rip Curl WSL Finals. So for Molly and, and Caitlin, they're sitting in position in that final five. And Gabby Bryan, the lowest seed, it will end up with a win to go straight to the quarters. And then Molly and Caitlin are going to feel that pressure. Remember, Steph and Tati are coming. Two surfers that have won out here before. There'll be a lot of pressure on Picklum and Simmers heading into the elimination round later on today. Great job to Gabriella Bryan. A seven and a five, six, seven. Puts her into the quarterfinals here at the Corona Open J Bay. Coming up next, world number one, Chris Moore headlines the matchup with Lakey Peterson and wild card Sarah Baum. We'll be right back. Katie Simmers wins the male Rip Curl Pro Portugal in just her third CT event. Molly Piccolo is your Hurley Pro Sunset Beach champion, and she's feeling it right now. Marks out in front, jams it again. She is on her way and seals the deal. Two-time world champ, Tyler Wright. End section approaching, she just hammers it. Tyler Wright has done it in back-to-back -back seasons. This has been an incredible ride for the Hawaiians so far. Wow. Beautiful turn there. Carissa Moore takes out the Surf Ranch Pro. Look at the current final five with world number one in the lineup now. Carissa Moore, what a year it's been. Winning at Pipe to kick the year off. World number one, then in back-to-back -back events from Margaret River to the Surf Ranch. Three big wins this year. 28 all time. Only second to Steph Gilmore on the all time win list. World number one looking for her second win here at Jeffries Bay, winning a couple of years back. Lakey Peterson wants to win so badly. She's featured in two finals and three events. And then adding Sarah Baum, the goofy foot, wild card representing Durban, residing in Newcastle in Australia these days. Even took a break from competitive surfing back in 2019. She had one of those stories where she came, you know, within a couple of heats of qualifying for the tour a couple of times in her career. Had a full reset, a move, more training, more focus. Currently number eight in the world on the Challenger Series. Yeah, doing very well. And she's uh, an incredibly strong surfer. On the forehand, she's got this big open face carb, powerful snap. 
the backhand uh, really strong as well. So uh, she's taken off on a couple of waves here. Nothing really of any consequence there. Just small scores. So uh, what she has done is put herself in third position on the priority order. So perhaps showing just a little bit of, um, I don't know, maybe nerves or just inexperience uh, taking off on um, some waves that potentially weren't really going to offer much of a score, but um, still plenty of time on the clock and we'll see this heat open up. Seems to be two types of personalities that you get from wild cards. The wild cards that overthink everything. And yeah. there's kind of an awe of the space that they're in, the giant cameras they're on the beach, seeing themselves on the jumbotron and on all the heat draws at the CT level, the media asking them questions. It could be overwhelming. But then there's some wild cards that just feel so loose and so free. They're not thinking about world titles and they can really just channel just good waves in the water. It's like, it's always so interesting. Which one is it going to be? You know, we'll see how Sarah goes. Yeah, absolutely. The other thing is a wild card. It's, you know, you've got to be careful not to get out of your normal routine and comfort zone when you've got the jersey on. You know, you can be guilty of trying to rise to the occasion and over surf. Uh, and that instantly puts you in a space where you're not used to. So. Um, you know, Sarah's just got to stick to her guns here, just settle into the performance that she's bring, bringing to the Challenger Series over the last few months, because she has been surfing just so well on that tour. And uh, yeah, I'd love to see her really push the, the more established uh, competitors in this heat. Let's learn more about our wild card with AJ. Joe, you were talking about the different mentalities that wild cards have coming into their first CT in particular. I got a chance to ask Sarah what hers is, and she told me coming off of Bolito, she has a lot of confidence in the way she's surfing in her equipment right now because she went so deep into Bolito. But coming here to J Bay, she feels like she's got high confidence, but pretty low pressure because she can't get any points here as the wild card. So she just really wants to surf in a way that she's proud of, in a way that she can make her country proud as well as. Uh, the female surfer from South Africa when she came out onto the beach a whole lot of people gave up a huge cheer from her for her she certainly has a lot of the support here on the beach oh we love that AJ and great insight she did come off a great result quarterfinal over in Bolito two quarters this year already so she knows what it's like to get on a roll more recently they had fun conditions up there the last Challenger Series event so she's benefiting of you know, having an extra event kind of behind her, rolling right into the jersey here at Jeffreys Bay with, with really nothing to lose. I uh, should be feeling really comfortable here and obviously uh, also feeling that energy of the hometown crowd. The South African crowd would just be right behind her here. And, and uh, well, if history tells us anything, you know, I remember when Geordie Smith and the like and, you know, even back to days with Greg Emsley and those guys competing, the crowd just goes absolutely bananas when the South Africans uh, do some good work on these waves. Gosh, I'll never forget that when Jordy won his first event. Remember that the World Cup was in South Africa at the time, and those Vuvuzelas, I believe they were called, were just sounding off any time Jordy or Travis Logie were taken off. It was, it was really, really a memorable moment. And that kind of backing is special. Sometimes it fuels them to do great things. Hopefully it works out for Sarah Baum. 1.43 and a point three start, so she's out of the whole priority game. Just trying to get a quick start. Didn't really get a great number. But you can sometimes look at a different part of the lineup when you're in the back of the line. We kind of saw that with Toledo's performance on the opening round, Richie, where he didn't worry about just pushing up the point. He kind of looked like Cano was running away from it, but he just had great positioning, great instincts, and got an 8-5 and beyond and won the heat. Yeah, absolutely, and it's it's not a bad move. We saw Ethan Ewing down the point a little ways during the warm-up, and he was getting quite a few. He was getting a ton of rides, actually, and that can it can happen here, uh, especially on these smaller days again where it sections down a little bit, kind of miss that top section. Just swing wide as the these ocean swells refract around the the rock point. They can feed some energy down lower. And that really is, uh, you know, as a third priority, if you're in this heat, that's where you want to position yourself. And then, you know, as the competitors ride from up top, you sort of take your position a little further up the point. And Chris Moore always has great positioning here at J-Bay. See so her looking at the beach, 
Always double checking her lineups, which is uh, so important. For even surfers out there not surfing J-Bay, working out lineup markers can get you great waves and you're not drifting out of position. Sometimes pro surfers try to hide their lineup markers from everybody else, that's top secret information. But a lot of these surfers work that out well before the event starts, knowing where to be at the right time. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's fairly straightforward here at Jeffreys Bay. Uh, even through the tide change, that there is a there is a point there where where Lakey and and Carissa are situated right now. It's that little corner in the reef there that comes down into the super tube section. And anything further up the point, you're putting yourself in danger of not making the wave. You're better off being down just a little bit further, maybe sacrificing 10 or 20 metres of the ride to make sure you're right in that zone. Where you can take off, pump down the line, and then you're really in tune, in sync with the pace of this wave. So many great people watching this event. Ran into Gordon Merchant the other day. Always great to talk surfing with Gordon. He's had a house here on the point for a very, very long mm. time. He started telling me the early stories of himself and his crew, the first to surf supers way back in the day. Originally, it was everyone surfing down at the point on those longer boards, you know, back in the 60s. And he kept looking up the point and seeing these cylinders just spitting inside out. And they had to go and everything changed. Well, it uh, really is a, a marvel, this wave. It's just incredible how long it is, how many different sections it offers. But when it's all firing, when everything's lined up, when the conditions are perfect, that super tube section, it's pretty hard to beat. Lakey Peterson got the winning feeling really early when the US Open was a CT event. Then about seven years went by and she started winning again. She'd actually forgot she had a CT win. She kept saying, I can't wait to win one. We had to remind her with our notes that she had one in the past. And she's like, oh my gosh, I forgot. She just was head down trying to really get in the title race. In 2018, she got to really say, honestly, she had a rivalry with Steph Gilmore, sharing a lot of finals together, including one out here at J-Bay. Came close to a world title that season. Through a couple of injuries, she's still working her way back into that world title type of form. Yeah. And she had an incredibly close call on the midseason cut this season when Carissa turned a heat on her without priority. And Lakey was able to survive that mistake with priority and compete here once again in the back end of the season. Let's hear from our winner of the first seat of the morning, Gabby Bryans with AJ. Gabby, we waited so long for your first heat. You wasted no time once you got in the water, got your first waves that scored really quickly in that heat. How did you think that aggressive strategy was going to set you up for success? Yeah, I went into that with a pretty um, solid game plan, and I stuck to it. And when it plays out, it feels super good. So, yeah, we came up with the plan, and I just stuck to it. And, <laughs> yeah, I played out. It worked out pretty darn well because one of those scores was a seven. Walk us through what you saw on that wave as it was developing. Yeah, that one, um, I mean, when they come, they have a really good direction. Uh, but I think I just saw I kind of had, had to kind of race it a little bit. But once I got past that, it had a, a good section for three turns. So I just got a bunch of speed and then got past that first section and then just laid, laid into the last, last section. And, um, yeah, it felt really good to complete that wave, especially because there's not very many coming through. Jay Bay is a place that I know is really special for you already punching your ticket to the next round, not having to surf in the elimination round. How important is that for you at this point in the season? Yeah, it's super important. Um, already in the quarters and the waves are supposed to be super good um, the next couple of days. So yeah, I, lo I love skipping that round. It's the best feeling ever. Are you kidding? Um, yeah, so excited. We're excited for you. We'll see you in the quarters. Thank you. Well done to Gabriella Bryan. Quarterfinal result at least. That's what she had last year as a rookie. So she knows what it's like to get the fifth, but she wants a bit more. And you can tell how excited she is knowing that we're in store for some bigger surf tomorrow. A little bit further back and out of the talk for contention for a title this year, but you never know with 20,000 points on the line for wins between Tahiti and Jay Bay as we look at Sarah Baum on her last. Oh yeah, that final turn. Just gets that uh, little hook on the backhand before the wave just drops out. So you can see here lip gliding floater here that sets up this final turn. 
jams on the tail section, pivoting off the fins there. Now she has to almost jump out of the lip. As that, uh, that little ledge causes the wave to just suck up so quickly, bottom out as we like to say. But uh, it's almost instinctual for these surfers. When that happens, they're able to na navigate through that. She finished that one well. The more time that ticks away with Carissa and Lakey not having a ride yet, it's, uh, it's really a solid approach for Sarah Baum, just staying active and getting wave after wave. So she's hoping the ocean stays the same and she's just picking up points underneath the watch of Riss and Lakey because they've dropped anchor. They're just waiting for sets at this point. Yeah, and, um, you know, it's controlling the nerves at this point, I think, and you'd have to think that... Uh, Carissa and Lakey have been doing this long enough now not to, to panic. They understand that the ocean can produce sets. Uh, in, you know, they always come in rhythms, but they can often come back to back. So uh, two waves, you only need two. Still plenty of time, 25 minutes on the clock. But uh, we see Lakey has uh, positioned herself inside Carissa. She's, so she's in the box seat. She'll control the next set. She'll have to make a decision because uh, you know that as soon as these lines turn up as a competitor, Carissa, she's going to put pressure. That's what you would want to do. You'd start wanting to push Lakey a little bit too far inside. All those little tactics to throw a surfer off their game before a set even comes. Always rechecking your positioning and trying to push your opponent. And it's annoying. If you've got the inside, <laughs> if you've got box position, and that other surfer starts to force you up the point a bit. You just kind of want to say, just stop. Just leave me. <laughs> I'm in the perfect spot here. You're going to push me too far inside. But it looks like it's all going to work out for Lakey Peterson. Lakey will just get started. Smaller wave, but a nice clean hook off the top. Wall starting to move. Nice pace. Floats and shuts it down. Riss is now able to take a more of a look on that next wave. It'll roll through. So Chris is going to lose priority to Sarah Baum, but Sarah's using it right away. Quick sweep off the lip, and jams her second turn Oof. in a tight space. So Sarah's been solid at riding out in a real shallow space. Yeah, smart surfing there from Sarah Baum, just waiting down the line a little bit more, getting those wider set waves, push down the point. You can see Carissa, she's coming down now. So Lakey on this smaller inside wave. She just wanted to get this heat underway. Wrapping snap to start things off. Then she gets the close out floater and then has to just eject as she ran out of water very quickly. So Lakey, a quick snap, pivots back into the, the power source and continues on down the line. Just waiting for that perfect moment to hit the lip. This is Sarah Baum. So this was further down the line the clean snap on the backhand. She's getting these finishing maneuvers, which is uh, proving to be very important. I think the judges will uh, deem that one complete, even though she hit the eject button shortly after she finished this turn. She really didn't have too much water to work with there, Joe. She really didn't. Critical section, but right there, her board's right out in front of it. I feel like she deserves credit for that finish. Just had to step off immediately. Judge is still thinking about it. Yeah, small J Bay, really challenging to perform on, trying to max out the best possibility for maneuver choice in a tight space. And you know that those big rocks are, are showing up very quickly. So Sarah adapting well to these conditions. First wave for Lakey comes in at a three. So she'll be in second under Sarah Baum. And world number one still being patient at the moment, looking for her fourth win this season. Yeah, we'll see whether the nerves are going to get to Carissa uh, when she stands up on her first wave. And it looks like there are a few lines marching through to the takeoff zone. This is one of the biggest sets we've seen since the start of the competition today. So you can be sure that Carissa Moore is going to uh, open her account. Now opportunities setting up for world number one and Sarah Baum as well. Sarah moving quickly down the line, ends up ejecting, running out of room. A 
And now Carissa completely changing her position now. She has first priority now sitting a bit wider. Yeah, well, uh, I just had a quick glance over our shoulder where we are, Joe, at the commentary booth. And there was, uh, I can tell you that that set had some real opportunity down the line. Uh, those waves slowed up a bit. So all our competitors still a little bit too high on the point. And as you see, Lakey and Carissa are now starting to work their way down. And the coaches, uh, you would have to think, will be on the beach right now, pulling them down. They would have seen those scoring opportunities gone missed. And they'd be saying, come on, get down. Because it's e always easy to go back up to the wave, to, to paddle back up the point rather than sort of come down and miss those sections. So adjustments being made for positioning. Chris are now not sitting as deep as she was on the point. Now the first priority trying to max out on the scoring potential that just went through unridden. So this heat still wide open as we have a chance to focus in on the Visla CT Shaper rankings. Mayhem at the moment out in front. We're going to have Pete Mel and Strider Wazalewski break this one down. down. What we see in the water right now is two similar surfboards, Chris Moore and Lakey Peterson, and uh, very similar in template, very similar in fin designs with three fins. And also the fact that we have the only thing, the difference would be Strider is what? Tell us that. Uh, well, I say the volume, right? So you're looking at about 27 liters in Chris Amore's board. What do you have? 25 liters. And then, you know, where they got the, the, the width and the thickness of the board is kind of up front here on the Mayhem. So we got a little bit more width and a little bit more um, thickness through the front of the board, which is going to carry down the line a lot of speed as this one seems like the thickness and width is a little pull, pulled back, yeah. yeah. And so there's subtle differences in template, subtle differences in size, but uh, very similar outlines. This is the rookie from uh, CI, uh, a longtime rocker that uh, Lakey has ridden, very comfortable with this rocker, as well as this one here, the driver. Yeah, this is a driver, but it's a mashup between the 2.0 and the 3.0, so it's kind of more of a custom board. You can't like go in and just grab this one off the rack, so it's kind of a specialty board for Carissa. They make a lot of boards together. Obviously, this one's actually really old. It's got a little fin pull through the tail here, but obviously a magic board that she loves to keep around. It's a 5.11, a little bit more length, and uh, these boards are really just confident under the feet of Carissa Moore. I think the similarities too in these two surfers in the water really is about the fact that they don't change their equipment up too much. They love what they ride. They stick to it. They stick to what works. And so, uh, you know, right now in the water, pretty even Steven, but uh, in the shape of rankings, a little bit of a difference. Mayhem's out front and uh, art by rider too. The whole family getting in. Matt Biolis' daughter doing all the airbrushes for the Mayhems. Love it. Thanks, boys. Strider and Pete, longtime friends on the board breakdown. Pete Mel rides a lot of Channel Islands. Strider rides a lot of Mayhems. So it was cool to see them dive into surfboard talk with models that they ride quite often. Remember that rookie model was uh, brought to the world, gosh, years ago now. I think when Jordy was on the team, he put a lot of input into that design. And you see it quite often on the CT, quite often in Lakey's quiver. And Carissa Moore made the jump to Matt Biolis when she was still an amateur. She had won a bunch of titles on different shapes and then jumped on the program with Matt and has never looked any other direction. Five world titles later, 28 CT wins, world number one today. She definitely knows how to get a great board for Matt. Yeah, Strider actually picked up on that uh, board being a little old. It's actually two years old. It's over two years old. It's at her favorite board. And I'm actually surprised she didn't ride in this heat because uh, Mitchy Ross told me that she was going to. So perhaps going to the spare, going to the backup, maybe because it was a little bit smaller. I think we'll see Carissa jump on that one on the old favorite if the swell does kick a little bit, a bit more. So solid when you bring something that you've loved in the past and it still survives all the different conditions that you put that board in. So well done to keep that quiver solid over the years. Carissa Moore is still waiting for her first wave with 16.50 on the clock. Sarah out front, Lakey in second. Back for more great action this afternoon at Jeffries Bay.
That was a special opening ceremony for the Corona Open J Bay, the group called African Drumbeat, authentic, immersive, and wow, what a memorable tribal performance showcasing the rich traditional Zulu and Kosa local tribes that you find here on the Eastern Cape region, beautiful cultures, and accompanied by the soothing sounds of a marimba band, world's best, got pretty active in that one, a lot of great dancing to kick off the event window. And as you remember, we got started on opening day, which feels like a while back now. A series of lay days and finally getting the contest back on for the opening round. And anticipating a pretty active schedule over the next two days with the increase of swell that Surfline's been keeping us posted on. Thought the also local legends like Eric Stedman giving us the local weather and news on the updates, checking all the buoys at Mossel Bay and Cape Town. So they know when that first wave will be arriving. Things still really slow in the water now, especially for Carissa Moore. Made a bit of an adjustment in her positioning to a real wide end of the point. She was sitting a lot deeper for the first half of this heat. She's still waiting for her first wave. Yeah, 27 minutes uh, gone in this heat. She still hasn't put feet to wax yet. So uh, you have to think that Carissa would be feeling somewhat frustrated at the moment trying to stay warm and limber so that when she does get that opportunity she can really perform it may come down to one wave hopefully she can get two and we see the ocean uh, start to flare up a little bit this last 12 minutes 13 minutes sarah bomb she stayed busy and it seems to be the appropriate game plan look at her just actively hitting the lip up and down you can see the rock showing itself on the inside crazy She'll just step off, save her equipment, bounce off the shelf there and get back to business. So she really adapted well to a very slow heat for waves. Lakey only has one at a three, Carissa nothing. Sarah Baum now with seven rides through this inside corner. Yeah, watch this, clean snap to start things off. Only a little wave, but she's getting plenty of speed down the line on the backhand. Did so well to get that final hit in. And uh, I think you hit the nail on the head. Adaptation, the key here. Lakey up and riding. Lakey trying to find the speed on this wall. Big wind up, attacking it well off the lip, and she sneaks out of there. Someone's got to get through, Joe, and uh, Sarah Baum has just stayed busy, identifying that there is scoring opportunity on these smaller little waves. And, and instantly, as soon as you're handed first priority, it's so hard to not just put the anchor down and go, I'm going to wait for the big set to come through. And, you know, there, there are waves out there where, where, you can, where you can start building a score, but Carissa's just thinking, oh, I want, a, I want a bigger set wave. I want to really get a decent score. As we see the replay of Lakey there, just gets the one hit in and, and uh, the wave just reeling off down the line, so unable to get a series of manoeuvres. Clean snap, nonetheless, her form's looking good. Board's looking good under her feet as well. You can understand the game plan of Chris Moore and knowing the sets that we have seen today. It's going to yeah. look dramatically different if a set comes through, which is with the size of the sections, the amount of speed that Carissa can gather on a wave like this and the size of her turns. She could easily go right into the lead if a set does come through with priority. It's just how long is she willing to wait? Yeah, well, it, it's 9.5 is what she needs, 9.51 9 exactly if she wanted to go straight to the lead with one wave because Sarah Baum's started to build a little tally here and uh, Carissa would be well aware of that. She still would be thinking, I'm going to have to do this in two waves. But frustrating nonetheless. R Carissa not surfing for second, second and third are reseeded in the elimination round, so it's all about the win. Be interesting to see now that she hears that she needs a 
if she'll adjust to break that down quickly, even if she gets one turn on a closeout, that requirement will dramatically drop. Chris Moore focused on a title race this year, also Olympic qualification, winning the first ever Olympic Games for surfing, Tokyo 2020 in Japan. And a silver medalist representing South Africa, Bianca Betendag, one of the greats that was able to represent this amazing region around the world for several years. She's probably trying to cheer on Sarah Baum at the moment. Always good to shout out Rosie Hodge as well for what she's provided in the commentary booth, a good friend of ours. Special memories for her at J-Bay. Hope we're doing well, Ro. Loves this wave and obviously loves South African surfing. Such a great part of the world with tons of waves up and down this coastline. A lot of these surfers did get mobile, left Jeffreys Bay when it got a bit flat and found some beach breaks to surf. Yeah, down towards Seal Point. We went down there yesterday. There was a uh, ton of the competitors actually head down that way. Some fun beach breaks. Just mixing it up a little bit, getting away from the zone. But, uh, so many great surfers coming out of South Africa over the years. Uh, caught up with Seth Hulley last night. Hadn't seen him in a long, long time. <laughs> uh, I guess back in my era, Paul Canning, another one. Another one of the strong, goofy footers. Shane Thorne. Oh, he's so got cool. a couple of wild cards in this event, I think, over the years, and he's doing some coaching now with Aiden Mason Kent. Oh, it's great. It's definitely a gathering place. Yeah. When this event's on, everyone from the past shows up to cheer on the next generation. A guy like Seth Holly, who's won this event in the past, they've had a lot of like specialty events here that weren't the CT events. And that list of champions is incredible, including names like Greg Emsley as well. Bigfoot. <laughs> Well, the fun part about watching the back end of this seat is to see what Carissa Moore might do. You know, she's won more than anyone in the water. She's had to adapt in the past. It's not your typical pumping Jeffries Bay where she's already got a huge total at this point. This is what champions do. They're thinking things through what is yeah, available to try to turn this around. And so I'm really interested what Carissa might provide for us here. Yeah, this is interesting. You know, Carissa's just holding her position down the line, which I think is incredibly smart at this point in the heat. And uh, Lakey's just tried to break away. She's gone further up the point. Sarah Baum's just tagging along because she knows that Lakey, she only needs that 6.5 down there in third position, and she's gonna try and guard that. So a small little line approaching the line up here. Will we see Carissa pull the trigger and get her first ride? Looks like she will commit. Small insider, long wait. Just a little setup slash on the open face. Just projecting down the line and really nothing for Carissa to work with after a serious wait with priority. Yeah, that was, uh, what, 33 and a half minutes for her to wait to, to take off on a wave here. So, uh, she finally stood up. It's only a one point ride. So it does make the requirement a little bit smaller. As you can see, Riz here just cuts that first snap short. She gets a little, uh, little lip glide, but nothing to finish. Nothing to finish that ride strong and really warrant some decent points. So uh, really frustrated here. So you see the requirement drop, even just with a 1.8. Now Riz needs a 7.7. A but she's in the back of the line for priority. A lot of space though between herself, Lakey and Sarah Baum are further up the point. So pressure is on. Remember she hasn't clinched the number one seed yet. Riss will be at lowers to compete for a six world title. Be interesting to see if she didn't have yellow, if she'd actually like that better. She's had a lot of stress that's come with being that final seed, watching all the competitors heading her way more specifically last season with Gilmore. She got the job done over Tatiana Weston Webb the season before, but definitely felt the nerves when Tati forced it to a third and 
final deciding title match a couple years back. Now hitting the five minute warning. Sarah Baum, brilliant. Staying incredibly active, adapting the best in this seat as a wild card. Had her own game plan and it's making a lot of sense now. Yeah, it's been one of those heats where, uh, you know, she's taken advantage of what's on offer. And uh, it's really hard as a competitor to to not have a sort of a preconceived notion of how the ocean's going to behave and perform and deliver for you. You know, in your mind, you're thinking you're coming to J-Bay surfing, you know, four to six foot walls, and it just hasn't happened in this heat. Let's get an update with Strider and Travis. Thank you, Joe. Yeah, here with Travis. Travis, Mother Nature is playing some games with us. Yeah, Strider, unfortunately, J-Bay, it does this sometimes. You know, it did exact opposite what, than what was forecasted and predicted, and it just really slowed down. So we're going to go and hold at the end of this heat and come back at 2.45 and have another look at it. Um, by all the forecasts, it's supposed to bump up through the day and, and keep improving, but obviously that isn't the case right now, so we'll take another look later. Thank you very much. You've heard it, 2.45. We'll give it another look. Back to you guys. Thank you, Strider. Thank you, Travis. Good call there. So to let you guys know, it's 1.22 in the afternoon local time. And next call, 2.45 to see if we'll finish this round. Just getting an update from upstairs as well. No women's elimination round today. So the focus would be to try to complete this round before showing up tomorrow with better surf. We'll see if that happens. So down to 3.30. Carissa Moore getting that wave during the chat with Travis Logie. Her best so far, 2.37. So she chips away, now needing a 7.13 to catch up to Sarah Baum. Yeah, so she's... Uh, let's have a look what happened on the replay here. So Riss just driving down the line here, waiting for that moment, gets a snap. Pulls through, perhaps thought she could have done a little floater to finish off, a little tail jam. Maybe netted a few more points on that ride and, and lessened the requirement to go into first place. But uh, it has been one of those odd heats, and as Travis said, you know, it, like on the charts, it's there. It's supposed to be here, but it just hasn't <laughs> quite showed up yet. And uh, all these swells make themselves right around the bottom of the Cape and then march up into Jeffreys Bay here. And uh, the direction of the swell can only be off a couple of degrees and that can sort of affect how, how directly the swell lines up. It's true, and he did mention J-Bay does this at times. It does. We've seen it so many times over the years. She can be moody at times. <laughs> Very moody. It's uh, Mother Nature. You always just want to wake up and check it and, and hope for the best. Definitely a lot of action, a lot of sets before we started this afternoon. But uh, Travis doing a great job. He knows we have plenty of time in the day in the waiting period. So just to let you know again, we're going on hold after this heat. Next call, 2.45 local time. It's getting closer to 1.30. A little over an hour to see if we'll finish the opening round for the women. Tyler Wright, Tatiana Weston Webb, and Joanne DeFay will be on deck for that heat. As we now focus in on minute 40 to go. This heat counts. It's got to be a winner. Yep. So far, it's Sarah Baum. Lakey with priority, though. A little closer to the lead than Riss. Peterson, two previous finals at J-Bay. Chasing a 6-5 for the win. Yeah, this is uh, it's an interesting one. You know, if Sarah does get the win here, she'll feel good about the fact that she's beaten you know, two champions, really. And, uh, but I think she knows that, that when things heat up, she's going to have to really dig in and, and bring that performance level. She wouldn't have scripted the way this one went. She would have hoped to get the win, but, uh, you know, she's just, she's made the most of the conditions out here. Well, here goes Carissa. Chasing a score, small inside wave. She's got a section, just a tap there, nothing much yet. And there's oh. a serious slash on the open face. See, that's what I thought she could have done on that wave previous. Maybe built some more points, but certainly a, a standout maneuver for this heat. And uh, the girls just breaking down the situation here. Just a bit of a chat. We see the replay of Carissa driving down the line and just picking her moment here, but love that turn. Look at the direction change putting all that speed and power into it. And this is what Carissa does so well. Really a trademark maneuver of hers. Look at the lean on it. That body angle gets really compressed and low down onto the board. 
has uh, that leg strength to you know, re-establish that stance. Chris Amor gets a 3.83 for one major move. Ends up bumping to second, but will have to face the elimination round with Lakey Peterson, and the wild card gets the win. He'll take that. Well done with adapting to the changing conditions. Caught eight waves in the matchup. The goofy footer representing Durban, South Africa, will go straight into the quarterfinals. Chris and Moore and Lakey will have the rest of the afternoon off and have to prepare for the elimination round. And you know, the one thing that that's on their mind is just riding waves. That was a long time sitting. Great call from Travis to go on hold to see if we'll get some more consistency this afternoon. Yeah, it's a good call, obviously. Um, you know, it just hasn't been enough waves for all our competitors and we want to, the competition to be fair. We want every competitor to have, you know, at least two or three opportunities to put some scores on the board. And, and it was pretty clear that that wasn't happening in that heat. So, um, yeah, we'll go on hold for a little while. Perhaps you and I will go and have some lunch and we'll oh, come back and see what happens. Making me hungry. Hopefully yeah. you have a bunny chow over there. Yeah, let's do it. Haven't had one yet this year. We're going to take a quick break. We're going to give you a little bit of an update after the break. So we'll see you on the other end right here at Jeffrey's Bay. We'll be right back.
Good afternoon, everybody. You're watching the Corona Open J Bay. It's a glorious afternoon, and after we saw a lot more consistency through the day, things slowed down dramatically after the second heat of the opening round for the women, and we've gone on hold till 2.45 to see if we'll finish the round. Thanks for being with us. Joe Turpel with Richie Lovett. A man that's won events like Lowers. He's finaled out here at Jeffrey's Band Finals Day, I should say. And he's seen a lot of great surfing over his lifetime. Richie, interesting because this happens at J-Bay sometimes. It is Mother Nature, which is why we love this sport so much. It always keeps us on our toes. And I like how Travis is managing the waiting period. It's not off for the day yet. We got some time to see if this swell will start picking up again. Yeah, we're just going to take a little lunch break and then we'll come back and see what's going on. But as you said, Jay Bay can be a little moody at times and she's just having a little quiet moment, just getting ready to fire things up in the, maybe this afternoon in the next couple of days because we know that swell is coming. It's definitely going to come around the corner and, and uh, we're going to have some solid waves in the next few days. But, uh, you know, what we did see today uh, was two heats so far and there's been some great surfing. Uh, and a bit of a surprise in the last heat. Yeah, that's the important part. Two completions, that means we already have two quarter finalists as we rewind the tape to the first heat. It was a, a young heat. Gabby Bryan was the smartest surfer that got an aggressive start into the fives, backed it up with a seven, and then really didn't look back. She's back in the quarters like she did last year. Yeah, fantastic surfing here from Gabriella Bryan. And, you know, composed a plan with coach Richard Dogmarsh and executed it to perfection. Got the quick start, put the pressure on, and found two of the best waves of the day. But some great surfing from Katie Simmons as well. But uh, you can see Gabriella Bryan just picking the better waves, getting these longer walls allowing her the opportunities to do some turns like that. A beautiful cut down carve, quick snap, and you can see just had such a good read on the waves here this afternoon. Molly Picklam here, this was her best ride, and that beautiful finishing carve. Coming a bit of a trademark for Molly Picklam. I love that turn, and she needed it because she kind of had one little sticky moment on the first turn, earned a 5.07 for the effort. Picklum and Simmers in their first start at Jeffreys Bay with the jersey on. We'll get more practice in the elimination round. Gabby Bryan back to the quarters. Remember, Gabby, the low seed. Picklum and Simmers inside the final five will have pressure to perform. If they lose in the elimination round. They have to keep that result, and they'll have all kinds of pressure on them heading into Tahiti. Second heat. You'll see the difference in wave size. They really didn't get any of the waves that Gabby Bryan had. There was maybe one just being out of position that went unridden, which was the story of this heat. And it was all about Sarah Baum getting a quick start, catching about eight waves. Lakey right there got a quick one, but was left behind the backhand. An adaptation for Sarah Baum made the difference in this one. Yeah, she really got busy once uh, priority was established. She stayed down the line, found a couple of these little runners was able to uh, get some good clean snaps done on the backhand. So against the two uh, well-established uh, natural footers here, she just uh, played a smart heat, took the win. This was a uh, risk towards the end of the heat. She waited you know, over 36 minutes to really get things going. And uh, she does a nice clean turn at the end of this one. Great snap and that's a uh, little snip, a little shade of things to come perhaps in the elimination round for Carissa Moore. Great to see that start from Sarah Baum. 5-1-7 at 4-3-3, her top two scores. 9-5 total, but the key message there, she sent world number one into the elimination round. Peterson, multiple time finalist at this venue as well, will be under pressure in that elimination round series. Well done to the wild card, Sarah Baum, into the quarterfinals at least, as she is standing by with AJ. You have no pressure and high confidence for yourself here at J Bay. And we saw that play out in your very first CT heat. You get your very first CT heat win. As the clock's winding down, what's going through your head as that sets in? Um, obviously, a lot of excitement. Um, I was just trying to contain myself and really trying to, you know, just take a deep breath, a uh, couple deep breaths. Um, yeah, it's super tricky out there. Like, these girls can get scores like, like, you know, in two seconds. So I was just trying to contain myself and just, you know, there was still a lot of time left. And um, yeah, I just wanted to really do the right things and the right moves. And um, yeah, I was so stoked. As you should be coming off of a fifth in Belito, you're going to head to the U.S. Open with us in just a few weeks on the Challenger Series. How important is a heat win like this as you work to qualify for this tour? Um, yeah, it just kind of makes me believe in myself a lot more. Like I, I always felt like I belonged here. Um, yeah, that's, this is kind of, you know, shows that. And um, yeah, super like a lot of confidence going into the US Open. And um, yeah, hopefully we can be back here next year. 
Jay Bay is a special place for everybody, but you in particular as a South African woman, what does it mean to you to hear that crowd yelling for you? Oh my goodness, like I was walking down the beach before my heat and everyone just started cheering and I was like, okay, just like started to get butterflies and I was like, okay, cool, just breathe and calm down. You still got a job to do. And um, yeah, coming up, the Groms are just running and um, bombarding me. And um, yeah, it's so awesome. Like the crowd and the support I have here is immense. And um, yeah, I just hope, hope that I can do them proud. I think you already have, but you get another chance in the next round. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Phew. Special day for Sarah Baum. Wow, well deserved. Uh, just getting that acknowledgement from the local fans here, getting her first CT win as a wild card with nothing to lose, and she'll always have that win over Carissa Moore and Lakey Peterson. What a special moment for her. Yeah, incredible. First CT heat to get the victory and some gnarly competitors there. So uh, I'm interested to see what she brings once we do get the quarterfinals underway. She's got some great surfing and uh, really on the rise. You can feel that confidence. Line on the line if we do get started again. Remember, it is uh, 1.30. Next call in about an hour. Heat three, Tyler Wright, Tatiana Weston Webb, and Joanne DeFay. For me, Richie, I can't get off the story of Tati and then Steph in Heat 4 yep. against Caroline and Betty Lou. I mean, they have so much on the line at this event. Yeah, this is uh, a critical heat here for Tatiana. Um, Tyler, uh, I checked in with her just yesterday, and she said that she hasn't been feeling 100%, just a little low on energy. Um, so I'll be interested to see how she performs and whether she's been able to pick herself up and really recover. But let's not count out Joanne DeFay. She is one of the most stylish and aggressive natural footers here at J Bay, and she could really push these other two competitors to the limit. What a crazy wild card. I mean, Joanne DeFay injured for the most of the season, but with her ability to throw, throw a lot of power at this wall, that's going to be dangerous. Tati feeling the pressure as a defending event champ. She's got a lot to be thankful for. As then we head into heat number four, world number three, Caroline Marks, has been on a roll. Betty Lou Sakura Johnson's been looking great in her free surfs lately. But then Steph Gilmore, a surfer that needs to compete for a ninth world title in September. She'll feel the pressure in this next heat. Yeah, huge. It's a, a gigantic heat, and obviously Steph needs to take the win, uh, or she's going to make life a little bit difficult for herself by putting that extra pressure on. Uh, I really like the way Betty Lou Sakura's been looking in the warm-ups. Um, you know, obviously hasn't competed here much at Jeffreys Bay, but she seems to be getting into the, into the sink of it, getting into the rhythm of it, uh, and obviously some good support behind her as well. Uh, but Caroline, she's here with Luke Egan. They've been working super hard. They were one of the, the surfers that got away from the competition zone yesterday over the last couple of days, went down to Seal Point. Uh, she's looking really good too. Lot to look forward to, potentially running two more heats before we leave the beach today. Check in with us in about an hour, 2.45 local time for the next call. And we'll leave you with WSL Presents, the J Bay event from last season. Enjoy that and we'll see you at 2.45. The World Surf League is the governing body of professional surfing, with the sole authority to crown the men's and women's world champions of the sport. Falling from the clouds. The WSL Championship Tour is the fight for the world title. This is somebody who wants a world title more than anybody. The 2022 CT comprises 10 events on five different continents, plus the Rip Curl WSL Finals. After eight events, crisscrossing the globe, the WSL now lands in Africa. We are thrilled to be back here on the Eastern Cape of South Africa. The local press is quick to welcome the world's best surfers, and the media is buzzing about a forecast of the best swell of the year. I'm predicting our best event yet. You can't imagine it gets any better. Today was a 10 for sure. The forecast becomes reality. Egos are rocked and world champions are challenged. Chicken. Yeah, that was unfortunate. She's going to be gassed for sure. Perfect waves breed epic performances and new champions arise. For the first time, we'll win a championship tour event. Stop number nine of the WSL Championship Tour is all about the waves. From the world's best right-hand point break, this is the Corona Open J-Bay. Morning. Morning, Brody. I think Jay Bay is by far the best right-hander in the world. The speed that you get, the size that you get, the majority of maneuvers that you can pull off on this wave, and then to add in a bonus, the barrels that you can get are second to none. Does, right? Sinks in a pipe. Oh, Ask any single surfer, 
they, they'll tell you that one of their favorite waves in the world is Jay Bay. Jeffreys Bay is located at the bottom of the African continent, in the turbulent waters of the South Indian Ocean, directly exposed to the raw power of Antarctic storms. When a strong southwest swell meets a stiff offshore wind, this unique coastline produces some of the longest, fastest, and best shaped waves on the planet. J Bay is a huge part of what makes the WSL Dream Tour the Dream Tour. You hear stories, you see videos, you dream about it, and then to actually come and surf it, it's, it is, it's a world-class wave. South Africa is, is such a surf-rich coastline. We've got so much swell, so many places to explore. Um, it's really beautiful. There's lots of sea life, sharks, dolphins. It's a real experience to actually come here. Um, when you have a lay day, you go to do a safari or something. I think it's good to switch to another mode and actually don't think really about the ocean for a minute. Jeffreys Bay is a surfing mecca a world-class wall of continuous breaking water that peels for over a mile. I mean, J-Bay is made up of several different takeoff points, but it is one perfect point. The canvas of turns it allows you to do. I love that you can kind of do snaps, wraps, laybacks, huge airs, tubes, like there's just so much opportunity. Oh, yes, he'll come out! Oh, come on! The speed of this wave, it's uh, something totally different than, you know, we surf in the entire year. There's not a whole lot of waves that you get to use that amount of speed on. Blistering pace, and he'll arc that turn down. It's such a dreamy wall, like such a big canvas in front of you to work with. Like, that's what makes J-Bay special. For many professional surfers, Jay Bay is their favorite stop on tour. And as the 2022 event begins, one surfer is celebrating more than others. Matthew McGillivray is all smiles on the eve of this event. The humble South African was raised in these very waters. And as a permanent resident of Jeffreys Bay, Maddie will surf as the hometown hero. I grew up in Port Elizabeth, and about 10 years ago, my family moved out to Jeffreys Bay for the surfing and for a lifestyle change. When I got serious about surfing, we were coming out to Jeffreys Bay every weekend, or even sometimes in the mornings before school. Jeffreys Bay was my big goal. And it's official, Matthew McGillivray securing the final spot in the chance to compete for the WSL Final Five. Yes, play on, boy. When I found out that I was above the cut line and I was going on into the second half of the year, I was like, I'm going to Jamie. <laughs> and so I'm so stoked to be here and to have this opportunity now. All right, South African surf fans, and you're in for a derby. Your man in the lineup, Matt McGillivray, is the man in black. Chebe has always been my dream event. We would come watch the event every year, amazed by what everyone was doing and trying to get autographs on the beach, and it's always been an exciting event. So I don't think I ever dreamed at that stage that I would be in the event one day. I always miss home so much when I'm traveling and I'm stoked to be here now. And in my opinion, it's the best ride in point break in the world. After a three-year hiatus, the Corona Open J Bay is called on. Thousands of jubilant surf fans have turned up to cheer on their favorite son, and Matt McGillivray is bursting with confidence. As we see, Matty McGillivray, the local boy. And now he's starting to really light up his home break. As he tucks into the barrel, he'll punch through the curtain. Another big open arc to combo turn. And another little tube, perhaps. And he'll come out. <laughs> Matty McGillbrake, big slice from him, cutting right back into the bowl. Steep section. He hammers it, drives back up into the pocket again. performance that he's going to be the local boy who gets the jump. Yeah, it felt like we, we were back in, in Brazil and I was a Brazilian, so it really fires me up to want to do even better and to try even harder. I just want to like make everyone proud and put on a good show and um, yeah, let's do South Africa proud. Well done, Thank you. Carissa Moore is the defending Corona Open J-Bay champion. 
a five-time world champion. Number five sounds pretty good. And the current rankings leader. Riss is without a doubt the female to beat. Fresh off a massive win in Brazil, Carissa is smiling and elated to be back in South Africa. I'm super excited to be here for our second to the last event. When I think of J-Bay, I think of the cool mornings and the beautiful sunrises. I think of the animals. I think of the warm people. Thanks, you guys. It is more than just surfing. It's, it's definitely an overall experience. So good morning and welcome to the second heat of the morning. Carissa Moore is out there in the opening round, getting herself into her opening ride here. Happy to be back here at Jeffrey's Bay. Last time she was here, she was victorious. She slashes through, able to hold on that rail. A lot of confidence in the equipment. She's going to try and just hold that run just a, a little bit with this ride. Nice hit, this wave, a nice flow to it. And it's cleaning up a little bit here as Carissa brings this one through to the inside. Goes to the layback jam. But an amazing way to kick off a campaign here. So layback on the end, hang the jam. I was like, okay, where's the finish? Where's the yeah, finish? I'm like, hurry, the rocks are coming. But yeah. <laughs> it's been three years since we've been at this magical special place. And it kind of felt good to get the nerves and a little bit of anxiousness out, refeel the rhythm of the wave. And I think we could all feel how awesome this place is. It would not be epic J-Bay without Kelly Slater. I think J-Bay is a place all surfers have to come at some point in their life. It's the most fun you can have in the water. After missing two events, Slater is back and contending for a record fifth win here in South Africa. He's going to come fired up because of the forecast looks so great. You know, everyone sort of like laughs, oh, you're just trying to chase good waves. And of course, we all are. And um, oh, God, the waves are good. The Corona Open J Bay continues. WSL presents the Corona Open J Bay. Kelly Slater has spent a lifetime chasing waves, traveling, searching, and scoring the best breaks on their finest days. I, I think J Bay is a place all surfers have to come at some point in their life. It's got to be on your bucket list of places to go to. You know, I think in the 70s and the 80s, Jeffries may have been considered the best wave in the world, but surfing's changed a lot. There's a different type of surfing we're doing now. There's a different type of waves that we're looking for. So I don't think there's a best wave in the world, but on its day, it's the most fun you can have in the water. Kelly has a deep connection with Jeffries Bay. He first surfed here in the early 1990s and was the winner of the inaugural CT event held in 1996. He has battled and beaten world champions, surfed more events than anyone, and has four J-Bay contest wins to date. That's more than any other competitor in the draw. I mean, thinking about some of Kelly's highlights here at, at Jeffrey's Bay, I mean, you can't look past the year with Andy Irons. I mean, that was in the midst of their rivalry, and Andy was in top form, and Kelly had to really work hard to get a win. It's a non-point fault! But that was one of the memories that I vividly uh, recall, is having those two in that rivalry was super cool. Kelly Slater is without a doubt the most acclaimed competitor in the history of this distinguished event. And it is an honor to have the legend back in the jersey here at Jeffreys Bay. The 11-times world champion is in the water, folks, taking on Baron Mamiya. As we see Kelly Slater up and riding. Really cool to have Kelly Slater back in the mix. Definitely one to watch. I mean, so much experience, past winner. And I think he's going to come fired up because of the forecast looks so great. He just extends that top turn because he knows this section's coming and pulls in. Nice and stylish, Kelly Slater. How fun did that look? 
Yeah, conditions are perfect. It's just everything you wanted, Jay Bay. It's one of those classic days we've ever had. So Baron Mamiya off the bottom, nice heavy back foot from him on the top turn. Just kind of swings those shoulders. He'll go into a low line and into a tube. This one cups out for Baron and nicely negotiated, gets a good exit. We can see some lines stacking up on the horizon now and Slater just riding a, on top of the water beautifully on this aboard. The 11-time world champion. He's been on tour for over 30 years and he digs in. Amazing 56 championship tour wins. Incredible and four of them coming here at Jeffreys Bay with surfing like that. And that was a solid finish. Thousands of devoted South African surf fans have turned up to witness the greatest of all time. And Slater thrills the J-Bay crowd with a big elimination round heat win. You know, I took the last couple of events off that haven't been feeling comfortable and confident in heats. My equipment hasn't been good. My mind's been really racy and I just need some time for myself. You know, everyone sort of like laughs. Oh, you're just trying to chase good waves. And of course we all are, but when things feel off, Sometimes you got, you got to just step off the train and, and take a break. The forecasted and very much type swell has arrived, and the women's quarterfinal heats are set to run in perfect eight to 10 foot waves. This is what we surfers would call epic conditions, and what ensued was a monumental performance. Tyler Wright up against Joanne DeFay. As we see Tyler Wright up at the moment, already has probably the best turn of this heat so far on that opening section. The women's quarterfinals were set up to be one for the history books. You know, the waves were absolutely pumping. The conditions were perfect. She does end up getting the best number of the heat. Good mix of variety there for that finish. And the girls did not shy away or back down, and they put on some incredible performances. Tyler right up at the moment, man, leading this heat, using her priority on this ride, and holding just a, a narrow lead over Joanne DeFay at the moment. I mean, J-Bay is a treat. It's, um, it's what the tour is about. It's literally what we've worked our entire lives to do is to surf lineups like this with no one out. On the outside, Joanne DeFay with four minutes to go goes after that big number. It's an 8.67. This may be her last shot at it. It's not going to be the 8.67 needed. Tyler Wright is going to progress through to the semifinals. You know, I'm completely devastated that I, was, I had to miss three events. You know, it kind of rocks all the hard work and all the pieces that you put together throughout a season and, and all the things that, you know, you have in place to build into a, a top five finish and a, a world title run, kind of have a handbrake you pulled on you and you're like, oh, it's a bit of a shock. I know the odds, but essentially i got to win. And yeah, that's what I'm here to do. It's 10 out of 10 out there. The Style Master is out there, the seven time world champ, Stephanie Gilmore, in this second quarter final heat. And these are the days when you're a professional surfer and you know you can't imagine it gets any better. And Gilmore has a beautiful looking wall. It's a good size. Steph looks to set up the barrel, stops on the tail, now climbs to the front of her board, gets the exit. The first excellent number is going to go to Steph Gilmore. To me, seeing Stephanie Gilmore get barreled out there was super, you know, amazing. It's just classic Steph Gilmore at J Bay. Just, it was just the way that she was surfing these waves was effortless, iconic, and just beautiful to watch. As she drops to the bottom of this one and flares straight up into the lip, huge turn to get started. And just watch how clean she keeps these rails. Not a lot of pumping between those turns. Just holds those lines beautifully. We saw all of a sudden Stephanie Gilmore come into her own. Best heat of uh, her career here at J-Bay in my eyes. Everything done with just all the style in the world. It's a distinguished performance, Pete. To get the win for myself and to head into the semi-final is, is awesome. As we reach the peak of this powerful swell, rogue waves break across Jeffreys Bay and Carissa Moore finds herself in the wrong place. A huge set came wide and just unloaded on top of her. Absolutely detonated. This is what the fans were asking for. And I was like, oh my God. The Corona Open J Bay continues. 
WSL presents the Corona Open J Bay. Jeffreys Bay is a staple stop on the WSL Dream Tour, a friendly town with raw beauty and wild waves. This is the CT's exclusive event on the African continent. You don't see Africa, you feel it. And um, when I was out in the water today with the dolphins and the sun rising, and there's something about this place that I feel like it captures all your, all your senses. J Bay is a magical destination with a world-class wave. To get in the water and just pump down the line and feel that adrenaline, um, I think everyone feels that when, when they're on a perfect J Bay wall. It really, truly connects you to why you love surfing. Well, big set standing up on the outside. When the swell is pumping, Super Tubes is far from a friendly environment. That's uh, Carissa's broken board before the heat. Wow. The women's quarterfinals are on. As Carissa Moore and Caroline Marks paddle out, a massive set of waves break across the bay, pounding the surfers deep underwater. Kind of your worst nightmare as a surfer that's about to paddle out for their heat. I had to swim in, do the run around, paddle back out. The heat was already going. I was behind from the very beginning. <laughs> Absolute marathon there for Carissa Moore pre-heat. Her husband Luke running down with that backup board at the moment. When something like that happens, when you break your board before it even starts, it can be really disheartening and discouraging. And she is doing the jog up the beach. It's a marathon effort. <laughs> the waves were huge, just massive walls of water pushing through. That was so powerful. It's Carissa Moore is finally on the jet ski, just going past me right now. What a mad effort for her. Carissa on the inside, having a look. Carissa Moore, big turn from her off the top. What a way to answer back through all that adversity. And this move right in that hook. So finishes up really strong. That's going to shed the nerves like a second skip. The way she pulled herself together and was able to get some, some really good scores just shows her composure and just why she's the champ. The priority with Carissa Moore just needs a two. Big first venomous snap from her speed and you dare say she's well on her way to a two without when you win like that and you overcome your own mind and all the different obstacles i think yeah it does feel even more special that way and uh, it gives me a little bit of confidence kind of like anything can happen now and let's go <laughs> Tatiana Weston Webb, another one that was fearless on the inside. Tatiana Weston Webb, she got a nice steep wall in front of her, goes up with a snap in the lip, straight off the bottom. This one hollowing right out. Tatiana, critical turn from her. Tatiana differentiates herself to the rest of the field by attacking those sections that a lot of people wouldn't. This is one of the big waves that we've seen. I don't even remember the wave. I just remember being like, oh, this looks like a fun one. And then it just standing up. And I was like, oh, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> like, I was just so excited. That section on the inside, it can pound you. It is scary. There's so much water in there. So as we see Tati, second wave of the set, shaping up nicely. I think today was really special. This is why we're professional surfers for days like these, when you're just dreaming about surfing all day long. And that, at the end of the day, your arms are just broken and your smiles from ear to ear. Yeah, today was a 10 for sure. Tatiana Weston Webb taking the win. Jordy Smith leads the charge for surfing in South Africa. Jordy is a veteran on tour with an acclaimed resume of success. Jordy Smith is really the beacon of hope for South African surfing. It's got victories in, you know, an era in the sport that's been dominated by a select few. Jordy Smith is always right there. He's challenged for world titles before. My earliest memory of surfing would have to be just down four or five years old at my local beach, my dad pushing me into waves. The thing I enjoy most about surfing is the freedom, the peace of mind, the passion. It's what I do and it's what I live for. When my life changed, I'd have to say around 18 years old when I got third at this event as a wild card. Uh, I think it was from that moment on that it made me believe that the possibility was a place for me on this tour and you have to go give it my best shot. Let's hear from the 2010 Bill Bonds First CT win was here at Jeffreys Bay in front of my friends, family, um, all the people that I've grown up in front of my entire life. Yeah, I didn't just kind of feel like I won it, you know, I felt like South Africa won in a way and that was really special. 
You think about Jeffrey's Bay and South Africa. You think about Jordy. He's had a perfect heat here. He's had two wins here. He's one of those guys that everybody really is rooting for. I mean, you watch him walking down the beach for his practice surfs, and uh, the crowds are around him. And it is unanimous. A 10-point rod for Jordy Smith. Jordy Smith and Jay Bay, he is by far one of the best out here. I think influencing the next generation and, and future generations to come is one of the most important things. That's kind of just been my goal, really, is just to be able to inspire people. And if I can inspire one kid, then uh, I've done my job. Jordy Smith is absolutely loved here in Jay Bay. And as the two-time event champion paddles out in the round of 16, Jordy is without a doubt the fan favorite in this tough matchup against Californian Griffin Colapinto. Let's see if Jordy Smith can put together another dominant performance here at Jeffreys Bay. Deep inside the barrel and emerges to a massive roar, just pouring his way out of a barrel. Powerful and smooth at the same time. Jordy Smith into the lip. Oh. Really nicely done. <laughs> Meanwhile, Colapinto is tearing across this wave. But he could well need this score. Because we reckon Jordy's on the way to a good number. What's Griff got here? He's patient, sets up really nice, just kind of flings that turn. That is a really tough maneuver to do. Yeah. All right, here goes Jordy. It opens up with a big wrap, hooks it back into the pocket. And opens up again, really nice, just releasing the fins, showing the variety. Absolutely textbook stuff from Jordy's looked really composed. And a bellow, a roar from the crowd. Jordy Smith gets an important win over Griffin Colapinto to keep South African hopes alive. Coming up next, the greatest of all time is back, and the fans are screaming their support for the 11-time world champ. Kelly Slater versus Jack Robinson when the Corona Open Jay Bay continues. Jeffreys Bay, located at the bottom of the African continent, is exposed to powerful Antarctic storms, and this year's event kicked off with a stellar midwinter forecast. It's just this long point break that peels down the line with these offshore conditions. That's what we all dream about when you think about Jeffreys Bay. It's chilly on the beach, and the waves are on fire. Kelly Slater is loved and supported by surf fans worldwide. On every continent, in every country, when Slater surfs, people turn up. Nobody pulls a crowd like Kelly Slater. They're not willing to let maybe their last chance to see Kelly compete in the jersey here at Jeffreys Bay slip. Yeah, conditions are perfect. It's just everything you want at J-Bay. It's one of those classic days we've ever had. Thousands of fans, young and old, have come to watch the greatest of all time here at Jay Bay. And in the round of 16, Slater faces a tough battle against young Jack Robinson. Um, Jack Robinson off the bottom, and then he'll set himself up here to go into the lip, a little layback energy from him, nice vim and vigor to that turn. Another big snap from him there, and you see a little hand stall from the bottom turn, and a really nice throaty tube. Now, Kelly Slater up and riding. Beautiful rail arc there. Drops into that barrel section. Of Even as a 5-3-3 for Kelly, put it in the lead. Meanwhile, Robinson, we ain't done yet. Big, meaty carve down again. Is he inside this? Is he coming out? This Jack Robinson is absolutely flying through a barrel here. Shut the front door. Jack Robinson points at the panel. How about that stuff from Jack oh Robinson? Oh my gosh. And that's the end of the eight. Oh, what a brilliant finish. 9.1 for Robinson. He went all the way home on that one. Went on back to the, <laughs> back to the house. <laughs> that was sick. Yeah, back to the castle. In absolutely phenomenal conditions, the round of 16 produced unpredictable upsets and breakthrough performances. Felipe Toledo brings an extremely fast approach to this speedy lineup. 
Toledo is one of the most enjoyable surfers to watch at J-Bay. As we see Toledo tucking in and finding a very deep barrel. But Yagodora pulling in, grabbing the rail. Yagodora streaking through a backhand barrel. Yagodora is awarded a 9.50 for this remarkably surfed wave. With a surprise performance, Dora outsurfs Toledo. Wow! Makes it out and goes floppy. <laughs> Italo Ferreira is looking unstoppable on his backhand, and the goofy foot stamps his heat win with the most radical finishing move of the day. Amazing control. Kano Igarashi shows off his stylish brand of progressive surfing, and the Japanese surfer scores a big win. Igarashi gets well and truly barreled. Matt McGillivray continues to stoke the hometown crowd with another excellent performance. Just falling into that frothy end bit, and he gets snuffled up by that white water. However, for McGillivray, his dream run sadly ends here. Ethan Ewing defeats the local favorite with a very powerful performance, and the young Australian advances into the quarterfinals. Just such a study on technique. But you don't have any right, mate. Just keep it rolling. Yeah. Is it like you have, mate? Sounds good. Ethan's just a, a traditionalist. He, he's, his rail surfing is pure. And how's this turn right here? Woof! Ethan Ewing is quietly redefining modern power surfing. Considered the most stylish surfer on tour, Ewing flows through his maneuvers with smooth, mistake-free rail surfing. Ethan is a guy that's really turning the focus of the criteria back toward rail surfing. That's how strong he is. He hasn't even really needed airs to get excellent scores and his biggest results. He's just dropped a 9.03, Ethan Ewing out in front. It's this flow, he's got this X factor. Surfing doesn't look like it's super dynamic, but it is. Style matters to me. When people say that I have a great style, that's a huge compliment. He has such clean rails, and the acceleration that he has through his maneuvers, it's just so much different. It is a class of its own. After seeing Griff get his, his first win with the, the 10 point ride, it's definitely pushed me and, and made me want it more. I feel like I'm kind of in a, a good space where I'm feeling comfortable on tour and I really want to go for it. This soft spoken kid from North Stradbrook Island has been quietly climbing the ranks and sitting inside the final five. If he can maintain a position in the WSL final five, I think he's got a great shot at a world title. As we move into the quarterfinals, Ethan Ewing faces a true competitive test. He matches up against the toughest Jay Bay competitor in the draw, two-time Jeffreys Bay champion, Jordy Smith. This is a location that allows Jordy to really create a point of difference with his power. Uh, he hasn't been past the quarterfinals yet this year. This is his chance. If I've got any chance of making that top five, the winners now. Ethan Ewan is up and riding. And there's that calf with style back down into the pocket, floating over that lip, re-entry, and gliding down, mapping himself back into the pocket to set up this section in front of him. Bang, really nice knifing turn. Now, this guy does not fall. <laughs> he is so steady on his feet. Ethan Ewan, it's right in front of Jordy Smith, putting that rail all the way back into the white water. It'll stand up again on the inside, into the lip. Jordy Smith, with just under six and a half, looking for a seven, eight, Rosie. Yeah, Jordy's really got to pick up his socks and think about attacking the next wave that he's on. And Jordy, with a white water takeoff here, it's not an easy one. We'll see him stand up at the bottom of the wave. Jordy Smith, will this one double up for Jordy? In the line now, he starts to prod and probe. Jordy with a ton of speed, big section in front of him, pulls in deep, he's absolutely flying, but that one will run away from it. And Ethan Ewan will advance. It feels really good. The last few events I've uh, haven't felt like I've kind of, I don't know, done my best surfing. Feel like I've, I've got a lot more to give. So just to get to the semi-finals and hopefully kind of free it up a bit more in the next heat would, would be really fun. Big section stands up here. Gilmore on the attack. Looks to set up the tube. Jay Bay's perfection sets the stage for an epic finals day. The game on here, tearing this wave apart. Super Tubes continues to pump and excellent scores continue to drop. And again, goes to the lip. The semi-final are next at the Corona Open J Bay. WSL presents the Corona Open J Bay. The sun rises on the third straight day of pumping serve here in South Africa, and with pristine conditions, finals day is called on. 
For competitors, attrition is now a challenge, as powerful waves and extremely long rides make Jeffrey's Bay the most physically demanding event on tour. You're going to ride away for maybe 30 seconds in your heat, so all of a sudden you're burning and you're all of a sudden kicking out, and then you got to paddle back out. So ultimately, you got to train hard to be a winner here at J-Bay. The women's semifinals begin with a matchup of world champions. Seven-time champ Stephanie Gilmore versus two-time winner Tyler Wright. It's their 24th matchup. Steph's got the jump on Tyler in the past. Tyler just kind of feels like she's getting her feet throughout the event, but she's getting higher and higher scores and just getting stronger each heat. And it looks like Tyler Wright's going to swoop on one to get started here. She's just really been clicking into that, that amazing form that saw her take back-to-back -back world titles before injury stalled that run. Some great scoring opportunity down the line here. Uh, she looks to line up that floating re-entry to finish, and it's a clean start. Yeah, well, the judges loved it. 7.33, a, a real pressure-building number. As we see Stephanie Gilmore up. Look at all the ribs in the face. She had to negotiate that, so she couldn't press as hard as she would have liked. As she digs into a couple of turns here on the inside. Needs to finish this one off. This wall starting to steepen. Nice snap there, but then this wave loads up with energy and she's not able to get around it. I mean, Tyler is going to get an opportunity here. And coming around the section, sets her up nicely for that first big turn. And she's going to draw off the bottom and now take a more vertical approach. Wants the big finish through the inside now. As she again swoops off the top, would love a high impact finish and she finds it there on the inside. And she's not done yet, Pete. Gets another hit in the pocket there. Tyler Wright is on her way to the final here at the Corona Open J-Bay with a strong performance. Steph, she kind of never really got started, a bit lost in the lineup, whereas Tyler, you know, found her positioning and found the waves that she knew she could open up and surf. Carissa Moore enters the semifinals as the standout of the event. However, the tremendously experienced five-time world champion makes a difficult error. Priority was with Black. Tatiana had priority, and there was Carissa kind of crossing the line of Tatiana. Priority interference means you only get scored on one wave. You lose your second scoring wave. An interference on Carissa Moore. Tatiana Western Webb won't mind it one bit. Tatiana Western Webb, up and riding. That move right there, so cool from Tatiana. Really what we've come to expect on her back end. Attacking the walls of J-Bay, staying light on her feet and agile. Nice vicious snap, gets that projection. Tatiana Western Webb will face Tyler Wright in the final of the Corona Open J-Bay. Disappointing for Carissa, it's just so uncharacteristic of her, but uh, yeah, Tatiana was into the final. The men's semifinal are the WSL's next generation. Four competitors who are progressing the sport with bigger turns, radical aerials, and dramatic barrel riding. They all are future winners and serious world title contenders. It's really like Jack can't put a foot wrong this year. He just keeps building on that momentum. Jack Robinson versus Kanoa Igarashi. This is a matchup between two of the most focused and determined competitors on tour, and neither will back down in a fight. Now here is Jack floating hard and high. It looks like he's waving for a board. He might have cracked his board. It's, uh, he's just going to ride up on the rocks. Wow. I guess the board must be broken. He doesn't care. He probably doesn't need the fins. He's, his leash is stuck. Steven up the rocks here at Jeffrey's Bay. It's Jack Robinson <laughs> absolutely oh flying gosh. over these rocks. And he's got a spring in his step. He's got a ton of speed. And look at this thing. Sticks that. If he gets around this, he's looking at a giant score. Whoa. Dropped his tail out. Look at that. There's no way you're making that nine out of ten times, and he just sticks it clean, and he'll get the score for sure. Teflon, Jack Robinson, he's through to the final hit. Ethan Ewing versus Yago Dora. This heat is a beautiful contrast of forehand versus backhand, power surfing with style. And we're going to see Ethan Ewing get things started first here, having some kind of year, but still chasing that elusive first championship to a win. You'd have to like his chances here at Jeffrey's Bay. That's such good surfing. I don't know how you surf that way better. There's been the Brazilian storm. That's been the theme. The Brazilians now, looking over their shoulder, got these guys, the youngsters, you know, and Ethan Ewing's in the Griffin Colapintos, and Oe Garashi's, they're all vying for that spot. There's been a shift. Your first final, what's it going to take to win today? Uh, I think just the right waves. Uh, there's a lot of waves out there that kind of go fat and um, don't offer up much, so I think I just have to be on, on my wave selection.
The men's final will be served by two young Australian prodigies. Jack Robinson with two wins is having a breakout year. And a very hyped Ethan Ewing is coming of age. Carves up into the pocket, drifts those fans on an incredible run this year. Let's see if Ethan Ewing can find the big response. Tatiana Western Webb taking on Tyler Wright. A fearless victory. A career changing moment. 50 seconds to go here. Coming up next, breakthrough performances headline the conclusion of the Corona Open J Bay. WSL presents the Corona Open J Bay. It's finals day. Look over my shoulder, pumping surf again. We'll be crowning a champion today. Finals day sees pristine conditions here at Jeffries, with the sun shining and a large crowd gathered. Tyler Wright and Tatiana Weston Webb are set to face off in the women's final. Tatiana is best known for her fearless attitude and hard charging demeanor. Focused and ready for the final, Tati is truly enjoying her dream occupation. I think a lot of people know me as a person that really likes to push my limits in um, big, kind of sketchy stuff. Tatiana Western Webb oh, throws oh, plenty of screens. She hangs on to that wow. one. Committed approach from Tatiana Western Webb falls out of the sky. Oh, here we go. Oh. Tatiana tucking oh. in. Wow, find some cover. The women have such amazing venues on tour. Pipeline, G-Land, Chopu. I'm just really psyched to have those types of waves on tour because it's showing the evolution of women surfing. Tatiana West Webb goes pipe, high and tight, comes out right with the spit. Now's the time for us to start pushing ourselves and showing the next generation that we can do this. Oh it's a wild ride. There's so many ups and downs, tons of pressure, especially now with the cut and then the final five and then the championship title. Now lighting up the finish. She can't hang on. Put some more. The 2021 world champion. I didn't realize that I was in a big recovery period during my time off. And yeah, so I just kind of acknowledged the fact that it was really hard for me to lose the title. Everything always goes wrong against so, so for her, it's all up here. We know what she can do in the water. It's about getting rid of the scar tissue from last year. Let's hear for your champion, Tatiana Weston Webb. I'm just trying to have a really good time, slow myself down, and perform the best I can on the waves that I get, and just have fun. With a carefree approach, Tatiana joyfully begins the final heat with an excellent ride. Tatiana Weston Webb gets that hook in the pocket to start. Stronger second one from the Brazilian. Behind her, Tyler Wright cracking it off the top. Tatiana on the inside, close out section to come. She goes for it and completes her first wave. Behind, it's all eyes on red for Tyler Wright. You can just see, nice, tight crack in the pocket there. Wow. Round of applause for the opening exchange of the finals, ladies and gentlemen. Tatiana Weston with straight back onto the front foot. She puts pressure on the rail and just flicks spray. Oh, that was really nice. Two good scores for Tatiana Weston Webb. Started with a 7.83, has now backed it up with an excellent 8.5. Tyler, you are in second. You're looking for an 8.83. This woman's power game and rail game is incredible. There's the layback with a little tweak of the tail. Vertical re-entry for Tatiana Weston Webb. Deep bottom turns, hooks off the top and rides out of it. Congratulations, Tatiana Weston Webb, your 2022 Corona Open j -Bay champion. Taking one home for the Goofy Footers. Number three in the world, how's it feeling? Wow, really? <laughs> oh, it's such a good feeling. Gosh, what beautiful waves we had for this event. I'm so grateful just to be a professional surfer. Tatiana Weston Webb just winning over Tyler Wright in the women's final. And we are gearing up to get stuck into the men's event. And what a battle it will be. 
The men's final is a matchup between Jack Robinson and Ethan Ewing, two very talented Australians who are poised to challenge the Brazilian Storm at the top of the ranks. Ethan Ewing in his first CT final. Jack Robinson, he's already clinched his place. He's going to get a shot at a world title this year. Robinson straight into one of those big drawn out calves, up into the pocket, drifts those fins, showing great variation. Jack Robinson, what a start to the final at 8.83. Oh, yes. We've got Ethan Ewing now using his priority on this one. Good looking wall standing up, smooth first calf, up into the pocket again. And there is a sensational layback jam. Oh, well, Jack Robinson would have heard the cheers, so he knows he'll need something here, and he throws the tail. And Jack is really in attack mode and glides out through the cut down to set up this hit on the inside, and Jack Robinson holds the lead here in the final of the Corona Open, J-Bay. Here's Ethan Ewing's turn, folks. He's going to pace it. He's going to attack it. This is a big wave. It's got magnitude on it, and he's going to attack it again. Free falls this time. Looking for the requirement and more now. Ethan Ewing down the track. Huge wrapping turn. He loves it. The numbers rolling through for Ethan Ewing. A 9.13. One. Ethan Ewing is going to break through and get his first championship to a win here at stop number nine. The Corona Open J Bay. I've been so inspired by the young guys you see, like Jack and Griffin, getting wins. And this event's like one of the dream events to win. So, yeah, we did it. <laughs> we did it. <laughs> For the first time ever from Ethan Ewing, we saw just explosion of emotion. He couldn't help but just let it all out. And I think that is going to be a major turning point in his career. <laughs> With his breakout win, Ethan Ewing climbs to number three on the leaderboard, and he closely follows Jack Robinson and Felipe Toledo, who have both clinched a spot in the WSL Final Five. <laughs> Tatiana Weston Webb also jumps to third on the women's leaderboard with her fearless win. And she closes the gap to Joanne DeFay and Carissa Moore. Only one stop remains on the road to the Rip Curl WSL Finals. The championship tour culminates at the end of the road, and the most dangerous event of the year will decide the final five. We will see you next in the South Pacific for the Outer Known Tahiti Pro. Thanks for watching WSL Presents. The World Surf League is the governing body of professional surfing with the sole authority to crown the men's and women's world champions of the sport. Falling from the clouds. The WSL Championship Tour is the fight for the world title. This is somebody who wants a world title more than anybody. The 2022 CT comprises 10 events on five different continents, plus the Rip Curl WSL Finals. After eight events, crisscrossing the globe, the WSL now lands in Africa. We are thrilled to be back here on the Eastern Cape of South Africa. The local press is quick to welcome the world's best surfers, and the media is buzzing about a forecast of the best swell of the year. I'm predicting our best event yet. You can't imagine it gets any better. Today was a 10, for sure. The forecast becomes reality. Egos are rocked, and world champions are challenged. Chicken. Yeah, that was unfortunate. She's going to be gassed for sure. Perfect waves breed epic performances and new champions arise. For the first time, we'll win a championship tour event. Stop number nine of the WSL Championship Tour is all about the waves. From the world's best right-hand point break, this is the Corona Open J-Bay. Morning. Morning, Jordy. I think Jay Bay is by far the best right-hander in the world. The speed that you get, the size that you get, the majority of maneuvers that you can pull off on this wave, and then to add in a bonus, the barrels that you can get are second to none. Does, right? Sings in a pipe. Oh, right. Ask any single surfer, 
they, they'll tell you that one of their favorite waves in the world is J Bay. Jeffreys Bay is located at the bottom of the African continent in the turbulent waters of the South Indian Ocean, directly exposed to the raw power of Antarctic storms. When a strong southwest swell meets a stiff offshore wind, this unique coastline produces some of the longest, fastest, and best-shaped waves on the planet. J-Bay is a huge part of what makes the WSL Dream Tour the Dream Tour. You hear stories, you see videos, you dream about it, and then to actually come and surf it, it's, it is, it's a world-class wave. South Africa is, is such a surf-rich coastline. We've got so much swell, so many places to explore. Um, it's really beautiful. There's lots of sea life, sharks, dolphins. It's a real experience to actually come here. Um, when you have a lay day, you go to do a safari or something. I think it's good to switch to another mode and actually don't think really about the ocean for a minute. Jeffreys Bay is a surfing mecca, a world-class wall of continuous breaking water that peels for over a mile. I mean, Jay Bay is made up of several different takeoff points, but it is one perfect point. The canvas of turns it allows you to do. I love that you can kind of do snaps, wraps, laybacks, huge airs, tubes. Like, there's just so much opportunity. Oh, yes, he'll come out! Oh, come on! The speed of this wave, it's uh, something totally different than, you know, we surf in the entire year. There's not a whole lot of waves that you get to use that amount of speed on. Blistering pace, and he'll arc that turn down. It's such a dreamy wall, like such a big canvas in front of you to work with. Like, that's what makes J-Bay special. For many professional surfers, J-Bay is their favorite stop on tour. And as the 2022 event begins, one surfer is celebrating more than others. Matthew McGillivray is all smiles on the eve of this event. The humble South African was raised in these very waters. And as a permanent resident of Jeffreys Bay, Matty will surf as the hometown hero. I grew up in Port Elizabeth, and about 10 years ago, my family moved out to Jeffreys Bay for the surfing and for a lifestyle change. When I got serious about surfing, we were coming out to Jeffreys Bay every weekend, or even sometimes in the mornings before school. Jeffreys Bay was my big goal. And it's official. Matthew McGillivray securing the final spot in the chance to compete for the WSL Final Five. Yes, Cowboy. When I found out that I was above the cut line and I was going on into the second half of the year, I was like, I'm going to Jeffreys <laughs> And so I'm so stoked to be here and to have this opportunity now. All right, South African surf fans, and you're in for a derby. Your man in the lineup, Matt McGillivray, is the man in black. Chebe has always been my dream event. We would come watch the event every year, amazed by what everyone was doing and trying to get autographs on the beach, and it's always been an exciting event. So I don't think I ever dreamed at that stage that I would be in the event one day. Yeah. I always miss home so much when I'm traveling, and I'm stoked to be here now. And in my opinion, it's the best Australian point break in the world. After a three-year hiatus, the Corona Open J Bay is called on. Thousands of jubilant surf fans have turned up to cheer on their favorite son, and Matt McGillivray is bursting with confidence. As we see, Matty McGillivray, the local boy. And now he's starting to really light up his home break. As he tucks into the barrel, he'll pass through the curtain. Another big open arc to combo turn. And another little tube, perhaps. And he'll come out. <laughs> Matty McGillivray, big slice from him, cutting right back into the bowl. Steep section. He hammers it, drives back up into the pocket again. What a performance that is going to be. The local boy who gets the jump. Yeah, it felt like we, we were back in, in Brazil and I was a Brazilian, so... It really fires me up to want to do even better and to try even harder. I just want to, like, make everyone proud and put on a good show and, um, yeah, let's do South Africa proud. Thank you. Carissa Moore is the defending Corona Open J-Bay champion. 
a five-time world champion. Number five sounds pretty good. And the current rankings leader. Riss is without a doubt the female to beat. Fresh off a massive win in Brazil, Carissa is smiling and elated to be back in South Africa. I'm super excited to be here for our second to the last event. When I think of J-Bay, I think of the cool mornings and the beautiful sunrises. I think of the animals. I think of the warm people. Thanks, you guys. It is more than just surfing. It's, it's definitely an overall experience. So good morning and welcome to the second heat of the morning. Carissa Moore is out there in the opening round, getting herself into her opening ride here. Happy to be back here at Jeffrey's Bay. Last time she was here, she was victorious. She slashes through, able to hold on that rail. A lot of confidence in the equipment. She's going to try and just hold that run just a, a little bit with this rod. Nice hit, this wave. A nice flow to it. And it's cleaning up a little bit here as Carissa brings this one through to the inside. Goes to the layback jam. But an amazing way to kick off a campaign here. So lay back on the end, hang the jam. I was like, okay, where's the finish? Where's the yeah, finish? I'm like, hurry, sure. the rocks are coming. But... Yeah. So that's, it's that's been three years since we've been at this magical special place and it kind of felt good to get the nerves and a little bit of anxiousness out, refeel the rhythm of the wave. And I think we could all feel how awesome this place is. It would not be epic J-Bay without Kelly Slater. I think J-Bay is a place all surfers have to come at some point in their life. It's the most fun you can have in the water. After missing two events, Slater is back and contending for a record fifth win here in South Africa. He's going to come fired up because of the forecast looks so great. You know, everyone sort of like laughs. Oh, you're just trying to chase good waves. And of course, we all are. And um, oh, God, the waves are good. The Corona Open J Bay continues. WSL presents the Corona Open J Bay. Kelly Slater has spent a lifetime chasing waves, traveling, searching, and scoring the best breaks on their finest days. I, I think J Bay is a place all surfers have to come at some point in their life. It's got to be on your bucket list of places to go to. You know, I think in the 70s and the 80s, Jeffries may have been considered the best wave in the world, but surfing's changed a lot. There's a different type of surfing we're doing now. There's a different type of waves that we're looking for. So I don't think there's a best wave in the world. But on its day, it's the most fun you can have in the water. Kelly has a deep connection with Jeffries Bay. He first surfed here in the early 1990s and was the winner of the inaugural CT event held in 1996. He has battled and beaten world champions, surfed more events than anyone, and has four J-Bay contest wins to date. That's more than any other competitor in the draw. I mean, thinking about some of Kelly's highlights here at, at Jeffrey's Bay, I mean, you can't look past the year with Andy Irons. I mean, that was in the midst of their rivalry, and Andy was in top form, and Kelly had to really work hard to get a win. It's a 9.5! But that was one of the memories that I vividly uh, recall, is having those two in that rivalry was super cool. Kelly Slater is without a doubt the most acclaimed competitor in the history of this distinguished event. And it is an honor to have the legend back in the jersey here at Jeffreys Bay. The 11-times world champion is in the water, folks, taking on Baron Mamiya. As we see Kelly Slater up and riding. Really cool to have Kelly Slater back in the mix. Definitely one to watch. I mean, so much experience, past winner. And I think he's going to come fired up because of the forecast looks so great. And just extends that top turn because he knows this section's coming and pulls in nice and stylish. Kelly Slater. How fun did that look? Yeah, conditions are perfect. It's just everything you want at J-Bay. It's one of those classic days we've ever had. Looks like Baron Mamiya off the bottom. Nice heavy back foot from him on the top turn. Just kind of swings those shoulders. 
He'll go into a low line and into a tube. This one cups out for Baron and nicely negotiated, gets good exit. We can see some lines stacking up on the horizon now and Slater just riding a, on top of the water beautifully on this aboard. The 11-time world champion. He's been on tour for over 30 years and he digs in. Amazing 56 championship tour wins. Incredible, and four of them coming here at Jeffreys Bay with surfing like that. And that was a solid finish. Thousands of devoted South African surf fans have turned up to witness the greatest of all time. And Slater thrills the J-Bay crowd with a big elimination round heat win. You know, I took the last couple of events off. I haven't been feeling comfortable and confident in heats. My equipment hasn't been good. My mind's been really racy. and. I just need some time for myself. You know, everyone sort of like laughs. Oh, you're just trying to chase good waves. And of course we all are, but when things feel off, sometimes you gotta you got just step off the train and, and take a break. The forecasted and very much type swell has arrived and the women's quarterfinal heats are set to run in perfect eight to 10 foot waves. This is what we surfers would call epic conditions. And what ensued was a monumental performance. Tyler Wright up against Joanne DeFay. As we see Tyler Wright up at the moment, already has probably the best turn of this heat so far on that opening section. The women's quarterfinals were set up to be one for the history books. You know, the waves were absolutely pumping. The conditions were perfect. She does end up getting the best number of the heat. Good mix of variety there for that finish. And the girls did not shy away or back down and they put on some incredible performances. Tyler right up at the moment and leading this heat, using her priority on this ride and holding just a, a narrow lead over Joanne DeFay at the moment. I mean, J-Bay is a treat. It's, um, it's what the tour is about. It's literally what we've worked our entire lives to do is to surf lineups like this with no one out. On the outside, Joanne DeFay with four minutes to go goes after that big number. It's an 8.67. This may be her last shot at it. It's not going to be the 8.67 needed. Tyler Wright is going to progress through to the semifinals. You know, I'm completely devastated that I, was, I had to miss three events. You know, it kind of rocks all the hard work and all the pieces that you put together throughout a season and, and all the things that, you know, you have in place to build into a, a top five finish and a, a world title run and kind of have a handbrake you pulled on you and you're like, oh, it's a bit of a shock. I know the odds, but essentially I got to win. And yeah, that's what I'm here to do. Yeah, it's 10 out of 10 out there. The style master is out there, the seven time world champ, Stephanie Gilmore, in this second quarter final heat. And these are the days when you're a professional surfer and you know you can't imagine it gets any better. And Gilmore has a beautiful looking wall. It's a good size. Steph looks to set up the barrel, stomps on the tail, now climbs to the front of her board, gets the exit. The first excellent number is going to go to Steph Gilmore. To me, seeing Stephanie Gilmore get barreled out there was super, you know, amazing. That's just classic Steph Gilmore at J-Bay. Just, it was just the way that she was surfing these waves was effortless, iconic, and just beautiful to watch. As she drops to the bottom of this one and flares straight up into the lip, huge turn to get started. And just watch how clean she keeps these rails. Not a lot of pumping between those turns. Just holds those lines beautifully. We saw all of a sudden Stephanie Gilmore come into her own best heat of uh, her career here at J-Bay in my eyes. Everything done with just all the style in the world. It's a distinguished performance, Pete. To get the win for myself and to head into the semi-final is, is awesome. As we reach the peak of this powerful swell, rogue waves break across Jeffreys Bay and Carissa Moore finds herself in the wrong place. A huge set came wide and just unloaded on top of her. Absolutely detonated. This is what the fans were asking for. And I was like, oh my god. The Corona Open J Bay continues. WSL presents the Corona Open J Bay. Jeffreys Bay is a staple stop on the WSL Dream Tour, a friendly town with raw beauty and wild waves. This is the CT's exclusive event on the African continent. 
you don't see Africa, you feel it. And um, when I was out in the water today with the dolphins and the sun rising, and there's something about this place that I feel like it captures all your, all your senses. Jay Bay is a magical destination with a world-class wave. To get in the water and just pump down the line and feel that adrenaline, um, and I think everyone feels that when, when they're on a perfect Jay Bay wall. It really, truly connects you to why you love surfing. Well, big set standing up on the outside. When the swell is pumping, Super Tubes is far from a friendly environment. That's uh, Carissa's broken board before the heat. Wow. The women's quarterfinals are on. As Carissa Moore and Caroline Marks paddle out, a massive set of waves break across the bay, pounding the surfers deep underwater. Kind of your worst nightmare as a surfer that's about to paddle out for their heat. I had to swim in, do the run around, paddle back out. The heat was already going. I was behind from the very beginning. <laughs> Absolute marathon there for Carissa some more pre-heat. Her husband Luke running down with that backup board at the moment. When something like that happens, when you break your board before it even starts, it can be really disheartening and discouraging. And she is doing the jog up the beach. It's a marathon effort. Oh, hard. The waves were huge, just massive walls of water pushing through. They were so powerful. It's Carissa Moore is finally on a jet ski, just going past me right now. What a massive effort for her. Carissa on the inside, having a look. Carissa Moore, big turn from her off the top. What a way to answer back through all that adversity. And let's move right in that hook. So finishes up really strong. That's going to shed the nerves like a second skip. The way she pulled herself together and was able to get some, some really good scores just shows her composure and just why she's the champ. The priority with Carissa Moore just needs a two. Big first venomous snap from her at speed. And you dare say she's well on her way to a two without. When you win like that and you overcome your own mind and all the different obstacles, I think, yeah, it does feel even more special that way. And uh, it gives me a little bit of confidence, kind of like anything can happen now and let's go. <laughs> Tatiana Weston Webb, another one that was fearless on the inside. Tatiana Weston Webb, she got a nice steep wall in front of her. Goes up with a snap in the lip, straight off the bottom. This one hollowing right out. Tatiana, critical turn from her. Tatiana differentiates herself to the rest of the field by attacking those sections that a lot of people wouldn't. This is one of the big waves that we've seen. I don't even remember the wave. I just remember being like, oh, this looks like a fun one. And then it just standing up. And I was like, oh, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> like, I was just so excited. That section on the inside, it can pound you. It is scary. It's so much water in there. So as we see Tati, second wave of the set, shaping up nicely. I think today was really special. This is why we're professional surfers for days like these, when you're just dreaming about surfing all day long. And that, at the end of the day, your arms are just broken and your smiles from ear to ear. Yeah, today was a 10 for sure. Tatiana Weston Webb taking the win. Jordy Smith leads the charge for surfing in South Africa. Jordy is a veteran on tour with an acclaimed resume of success. Jordy Smith is really the beacon of hope for South African surfing. It's got victories in, you know, an era in the sport that's been dominated by a, a select few. Jordy Smith is always right there. He's challenged for world titles before. My earliest memory of surfing would have to be just down four or five years old at my local beach. My dad pushing me into waves. Oh, the thing I enjoy most about surfing is the freedom, the peace of mind, the passion. It's what I do and it's what I live for. To my life changed, I'd have to say around 18 years old when I got third at this event as a wild card. Uh, I think it was from that moment on that it made me believe that the possibility was a place for me on this tour and yeah, to go give it my best shot. For your 2010 Bill Bond first CT win was here at Jeffreys Bay in front of my friends, family, um, all the people that I've grown up in front of my entire life. Yeah, you know, I didn't just kind of feel like I won it. You know, I felt like South Africa won in a way, and that was really special. When you think about Jeffreys Bay and South Africa, you think about Jordy. He's had a perfect heat here. He's had two wins here. He's one of those guys that everybody really is rooting for. I mean, you watch him walking down the beach for his practice surfs and uh, the crowds are around him. And it is unanimous. A 10-point ride for Jordy Smith. Jordy Smith and Jay Bay, he is by far one of the best out here. I think influencing the next generation and, and future generations to come is one of the most important things. 
that's kind of just been my goal, really, is just to be able to inspire people. And if I can inspire one kid, then uh, I've done my job. Jordy Smith is absolutely loved here in Jay Bay. And as the two-time event champion paddles out in the round of 16, Jordy is without a doubt the fan favorite in this tough matchup against Californian Griffin Colapinto. Let's see if Jordy Smith can put together another dominant performance here at Jeffreys Bay. Deep inside the barrel and emerges to a massive roar, just pouring his way out of a barrel. Powerful and smooth at the same time. Jordy Smith into the lip. Oh. Really nicely done. <laughs> Meanwhile, Colapinto is tearing across this wave. But he could well need this score. Because we reckon Jordy's on the way to a good number. What's Griff got here? He's patient, sets up really nice, just kind of flings that turn. That is a really tough maneuver to do. All right, here goes Jordy. It opens up with a big wrap, hooks it back into the pocket. And opens up again, really nice, just releasing the fins, showing the variety. Absolutely textbook stuff from Jordi, has looked really composed. And a bellow, a roar from the crowd. Jordi Smith gets an important win over Griffin Colapinto to keep South African hopes alive. Coming up next, the greatest of all time is back and the fans are screaming their support for the 11-time world champ. Kelly Slater versus Jack Robinson when the Corona Open Jay Bay continues. But there's some good ones also from up top. Oh, yeah. The medium size ones, yeah. the tires going lower, they're yeah. stretching and they're, and they're building. Jeffreys Bay, located at the bottom of the African continent, is exposed to powerful Antarctic storms. And this year's event kicked off with a stellar midwinter forecast. It's just this long point break that peels down the line with these offshore conditions. That's what we all dream about when you think about Jeffreys Bay. It's chilly on the beach and the waves are on fire. Kelly Slater is loved and supported by surf fans worldwide. On every continent, in every country, when Slater surfs, people turn up. Nobody pulls a crowd like Kelly Slater. They're not willing to let maybe their last chance to see Kelly compete in the jersey here at Jeffreys Bay slip. Yeah, conditions are perfect. It's just everything you want at J-Bay. It's one of those classic days we've ever had. Thousands of fans, young and old, have come to watch the greatest of all time here at J-Bay. And in the round of 16, Slater faces a tough battle against young Jack Robinson. Um, Jack Robinson, off the bottom. And it'll set himself up here to go into the lip. Little layback energy from him. Nice vim and vigor to that turn. Another big snap from him there. And you see a little hand stall from the bottom turn. And a really nice throaty tube. Now, Kelly Slater up and riding. Beautiful rail arc there. Drops into that barrel section. Of Even as a 5-3-3 for Kelly, put it in the lead. Meanwhile, Robinson, we ain't done yet. Big, meaty carve down again. Is he inside this? Is he coming out? This Jack Robinson is absolutely flying through a barrel here. Shut the front door. Jack Robinson points at the panel. How about that stuff from Jack oh Robinson? Oh, my gosh. And that's the end of the heat. Well, what a brilliant finish. 9.1 for Robinson. He went all the way home on that one. Went on back to, <laughs> back to the house. <laughs> that was sick. I ran into the castle. In absolutely phenomenal conditions, the round of 16 produced unpredictable upsets and breakthrough performances. Felipe Toledo brings an extremely fast approach to this speedy lineup. Toledo is one of the most enjoyable surfers to watch at J-Bay. As we see Toledo tucking in and finding a very deep barrel. But Yago Dora pulling in, grabbing the rail. Yago Dora streaking through a backhand barrel. Yago Dora is awarded a 9.50 for this remarkably surfed wave. With a surprise performance, Dora outsurfs Toledo. Wow! Makes it out and goes floppy. <laughs> Italo Ferreira is looking unstoppable on his backhand. 
and the goofy foot stamps his heat win with the most radical finishing move of the day. Amazing control. Kuno Igarashi shows off his stylish brand of progressive surfing, and the Japanese surfer scores a big win. Igarashi gets well and truly barreled. Matt McGillivray continues to stoke the hometown crowd with another excellent performance. Just falling into that frothy end bit, and he gets snuffled up by that white water. However, for McGillivray, his dream run sadly ends here. Ethan Ewing defeats the local favorite with a very powerful performance, and the young Australian advances into the quarterfinals. Just such a study on technique. But you're doing everything right, mate. Just keep it rolling. Is it like you have, mate? Ethan's just a, a traditionalist. He, he's, his rail surfing is pure. And how's this turn right here? Woof! Ethan Ewing is quietly redefining modern power surfing. Considered the most stylish surfer on tour, Ewing flows through his maneuvers with smooth, mistake-free rail surfing. Ethan is a guy that's really turning the focus of the criteria back toward rail surfing. That's how strong he is. He hasn't even really needed airs to get excellent scores and his biggest results. He's just dropped a 9.03, Ethan Ewing out in front. It's this flow, he's got this X factor. Surfing doesn't look like it's super dynamic, but it is. Style matters to me. When people say that I have a great style, that's a huge compliment. He has such clean rails and the acceleration that he has through his maneuvers, it's just so much different. It is a class of its own. After seeing Griff get his, his first win with the, the 10 point ride, it's definitely pushed me and, and made me want it more. I feel like I'm kind of in a, a good space where I'm feeling comfortable on tour and I really want to go for it. This soft spoken kid from North Stradbrook Island has been quietly climbing the ranks and sitting inside the final five. If he can maintain a position in the WSL final five, oh, I think he's got a great shot at a world title. As we move into the quarterfinals, Ethan Ewing faces a true competitive test. He matches up against the toughest Jay Bay competitor in the draw, two-time Jeffreys Bay champion, Jordy Smith. This is a, a location that allows Jordy to really create a, a point of difference with his power. Uh, he hasn't been past the quarterfinals yet this year. This is his chance. If I've got any chance of making that top five, the winners now. Ethan Ewan is up and riding. And there's that carve with style. Back down into the pocket, floating over that lip, re-entry, then gliding down, mapping himself back into the pocket to set up this section in front of him. Bang, really nice knifing turn. Yeah, this guy does not fall. <laughs> he is so steady on his feet. Ethan Ewan's right in front of Geordie Smith, putting that rail all the way back into the white water. It'll stand up again on the inside, into the lip. Geordie Smith with just under six and a half, looking for a seven, eight, Rosie. Yeah, Geordie's really got to pick up his socks and think about attacking the next wave that he's on. And Geordie with a white water takeoff here. It's not an easy one. We'll see him stand up at the bottom of the wave. Geordie Smith, will this one double up for Geordie? In the line now, he starts to prod and probe. Geordie with a ton of speed, big section in front of him, pulls in deep. He's absolutely flying, but that one will run away from it. And Ethan Ewan will advance. It feels really good. The last few events I've uh, haven't felt like I've kind of, I don't know, done my best surfing. Feel like I've, I've got a lot more to give. So just to get to the semi-finals and hopefully kind of free it up a bit more in the next heat would, would be really fun. Big section stands up here. Gilmore on the attack. Looks to set up the tube. Jay Bay's perfection sets the stage for an epic finals day. The game on here, tearing this wave apart. Super Tubes continues to pump, and excellent scores continue to drop. And again, goes to the lip. The semifinals are next at the Corona Open J Bay. WSL presents the Corona Open J Bay. The sun rises on the third straight day of pumping surf here in South Africa, and with pristine conditions, finals day is called on. For competitors, attrition is now a challenge, as powerful waves and extremely long rides make Jeffreys Bay the most physically demanding event on tour. You're gonna ride away for maybe 30 seconds in your heat, so all of a sudden you're burning and you're all of a sudden kicking out, and then you gotta paddle back out. So ultimately, you gotta train hard to be a winner here at J-Bay. The women's semifinals begin with a matchup of world champions. 
Seven-time champ Stephanie Gilmore versus two-time winner Tyler Wright. It's their 24th matchup. Steph's got the jump on Tyler in the past. Tyler just kind of feels like she's getting her feet throughout the event, but she's getting higher and higher scores and just getting stronger each heat. And it looks like Tyler Wright's going to swoop on one to get started here. She's just really been clicking into that, that amazing form that saw her take back-to-back -back world titles before injury stalled that run. Some great scoring opportunity down the line here. Uh, she looks to line up that floating re-entry to finish, and it's a clean start. Yeah, well, the judges loved it. 7.33, a, a real pressure-building number. As we see Stephanie Gilmore up. Look at all the ribs in the face. She had to negotiate that, so she couldn't press as hard as she would have liked. Uh, she digs into a couple of turns here on the inside. Needs to finish this one off. This wall starting to steepen. Nice snap there, but then this wave loads up with energy, and she's not able to get around it. I mean, Tyler is going to get an opportunity here. And coming around the section, sets her up nicely for that first big turn. And she's going to draw off the bottom and now take a more vertical approach. Wants the big finish through the inside now. As she again swoops off the top. Would love a high impact finish and she finds it there on the inside. And she's not done yet, Pete. Gets another hit in the pocket there. Tyler Wright is on her way to the final here at the Corona Open J-Bay with a strong performance. Steph, she kind of never really got started, a bit lost in the lineup, whereas Tyler you know, found her positioning and found the waves that she knew she could open up and surf. Carissa Moore enters the semifinals as the standout of the event. However, the tremendously experienced five-time world champion makes a difficult error. Priority was with Black. Tatiana had priority, and there was Carissa kind of crossing the line of Tatiana. Priority interference means you only get scored on one wave. You lose your second scoring wave. An interference on Carissa Moore. Tatiana Weston Webb won't mind it one bit. Tatiana Weston Webb, up and riding. That move right there, so cool from Tatiana. Really what we've come to expect on her back end, attacking the walls of j -Bait. staying light on her feet and agile. Nice vicious snap, gets that projection. Tatiana Westenweb will face Tyler Wright in the final of the Corona Open j -Bait. Disappointing for Carissa, it's just so uncharacteristic of her, but uh, yeah, Tatiana was into the final. The men's semifinal are the WSL's next generation. Four competitors who are progressing the sport with bigger turns, radical aerials, and dramatic barrel riding. They all are future winners and serious world title contenders. It's really like Jack can't put a foot wrong this year. He just keeps building on that momentum. Jack Robinson versus Kanoa Igarashi. This is a matchup between two of the most focused and determined competitors on tour, and neither will back down in a fight. Now here is Jack floating hard and high. It looks like he's waving for a board. He might have cracked his board. It's, uh, he's just gonna ride up on the rocks. I guess the board must be broken, he doesn't care. He probably doesn't need the fins. He's, his leash is stuck. Steaming up the rocks here at Jeffreys Bay. It's Jack Robertson <laughs> absolutely oh flying gosh. over these rocks. And he's got a spring in his step. He's got a ton of speed. And look at this thing. Sticks that. If he gets around this, he's looking at a giant score. Whoa. Dropped his tail out. Look at that. There's no way you're making that nine out of 10 times. And he just sticks it clean, and he'll get the score for sure. Teflon, Jack Robertson. He's through to the final hit. Ethan Ewing versus Yago Dora. This heat is a beautiful contrast of forehand versus backhand, power surfing with style. And we're gonna see Ethan Ewing get things started first here, having some kind of year, but still chasing that elusive first championship to a win. You'd have to like his chances here at Jeffreys Bay. That's such good surfing. I don't know how you surf that way better. There's been the Brazilian storm. That's been the theme. The Brazilians now looking over their shoulder, got these guys, the youngsters, you know, and Ethan Ewing's in the Griffin Golapintos, and Noe Garashi, they're all vying for that spot. There's been a shift. Your first final, what's it gonna take to win today? Uh, I think just the right waves. Uh, there's a lot of waves out there that kind of go fat and um, don't offer up much. So uh, I think I just have to be on, on my wave selection. The men's final will be served by two young Australian prodigies. Jack Robinson with two wins is having a breakout year. 
and a very hyped Ethan Ewing is coming of age. Calves up into the pocket, drifts those fans on an incredible run this year. Let's see if Ethan Ewing can find the big response. Tatiana Western Webb taking on Tyler Wright. A fearless victory, a career changing moment. 50 seconds to go here. Coming up next, breakthrough performances headline the conclusion of the Corona Open J Bay. WSL presents the Corona Open J Bay. It's finals day. Look over my shoulder. Welcome in to the Corona Post Show. It is a beautiful day here in Jeffreys Bay, South Africa, taking a beautiful look here at what it looks like from the sky. You can see those lines coming in, but a little tricky here in the Bay today. Welcome into the Corona Post Show. I'm AJ McCord alongside Peter Mel and Paul Evans. So you guys, we've waited a few days for the ocean to flip on for us here in J Bay. Got two heats done of the women today. Some really impactful moments as well for these women. What is the biggest thing that stood out to you? Well, only two heats today. I mean, we waited, had to wait, hoping the swell would pump up and uh, a little more consistency would come. We saw some moments, got the uh, contest underway, but just uh, not enough waves, unfortunately, but uh, some high action there um, in those heats. And strategy, uh, strategy had to play a big role there for both uh, both those heats. KG, a really mm. KG afternoon. The surfers in the Red Bull Athlete Zone look really nervous. There's a lot of you know big experience there looking at the ocean. And the ocean itself, pretty KG. The energy, intermittent. You'd see a good one, then it would sit down. It's a weird afternoon. We did see a, the aggressive strategy play off for both Gabriella Bryan and Sarah Baum catching waves really early, really often. Of course, Sarah, the wild card here in South Africa. So she's from just a few hours away, has a lot of experience here in J Bay. We saw that. So let's get a send down to Strider Wazlewski. He's with Travis Logie for the call for the afternoon. Thanks, guys. Down here with Travis Logie. Travis, we've been called off for the day. Why was that, and what are we looking forward to? Yeah, Strides, there just wasn't enough out there for three surfers. You know, every now and then a decent set comes through, but it definitely feels like the energy's dying out slowly. So we have a great forecast for tomorrow and the next day. So we're pretty confident there'll be a lot of surfing happening in the next couple of days. So check back in tomorrow morning. Do you think we'll be able to get it done in the next couple of days? Yeah, we, if we, we just worked out the timing just then. We, we probably have just enough to get it done in the next two days. And then we have... Thursday morning as a potential fallback, although, although that's really unpredictable. But uh, the next couple of days are going to be great no matter what. Thank you very much, Trav. Back to you, AJ. Thank you so much, Strider. So we'll look for that in the next few days. Jeffrey's Bay going to look a lot more like what we're used to seeing here pumping surf, a lot of waves coming through, and it's a good thing for the last two heats as well. Let's take a look at the last two heats of the women's opening round that will be coming your way as soon as we are next called on. First thing, Pete, look at this one. Tyler Wright, the defending champ here in J-Bay, Tatiana Weston-Webb, and Joanne DeFay. Sheesh, some experience in that heat. Hey, big time, you know, and Tyler Wright, she was able to kind of sit back and watch conditions, and she was definitely ready for her heat. Joanne DeFay, on the other hand, is a lot more involved in the calls, so, you know, she's trying to get ready for her heat, but all also, being the surfer's rep, she's in there talking to Trav, trying to figure out what they're going to do for the day. Uh, so a little distracted probably for Joanne DeFay, <laughs> but I, know, I mean, ultimately, I think that, uh, you know, when you look at it happening tomorrow, better off for her. There's yep. going to be some more waves tomorrow, fingers crossed. A repeat of last year's final with those two surfers, so it'd be good to see that matchup fire up again. I know Tati should be wanting it to be pretty solid, right? Um, and then, yeah, just thinking about Joanne DeFay, who's had kind of a weird season with the injury. She just want to get going here. She mentioned to me earlier she missed the swell before the event. Ooh. She hasn't got a great read on the ocean so far. Bit of a free hit for her mm. in this part of the season, but she'll want to go good out here for sure. Absolutely. If there's anybody who can turn it on quick, it's going to be Joanne DeFay. And then the last, the last 
last heat of the women's opening round. Take a look at what we have here. You got Caroline Marks, Stephanie Gilmore, Betty Lou Sakura Johnson. Uh huh. The Groms against the Goat, right? <laughs> I mean, that's a, a heat you're going to want to watch. Both these surfers obviously love competing against the best of all time and Stephanie Gilmore. And Steph Gilmore here at J Bay, match made in heaven. Yeah, relatively speaking, sitting in six. Steph needs a result here, and this is her spot, right? This is her wave, and you probably look forward as well to Tahiti, and I think she'd probably admit as well that's not summer. She'd maybe back herself for a huge result, so she'll definitely need to uh, make some heats here. Looking forward to seeing those ladies in action as soon as the waves turn on here at Jeffreys Bay. We'll have our next call tomorrow morning. But in the meantime, we did get to see not just Stephanie Gilmore and some of the CT surfers in action earlier this week, but some of the young up and coming female surfers from this region. Check out this edition of Rising Tides. I think one of the most important things about Rising Tides J Bay is that it is inclusive and it does include girls from all different races, ages, different areas um, all around South Africa. There's actually some other initiatives that come and bring some underprivileged kids from all around South Africa. So Surfers Not Street Children is an organisation that helps black female surfers but also other children who would like to start surfing, children at risk of going the bad path. Yeah, girls! Good job, ladies. Yeah, just getting them off the streets and, and getting them into the water where they can really find a passion in their life and something that hopefully they'll, you know, have that purpose. Julia from Surfers Not Street Children is our first Mozambican surfer girl. Sinto sim, e o que eu sinto é que tem que seguir mais à frente. Quando eu desistir agora, você apanhar aquele chave. E eu acho que também as meninas podem desistir. Just to see her lead the way for so many other young women in Mozambique and other parts of Africa, I think that's really special. Rising tides encourages the growth of women surfing because number one, to meet their heroes is so important for them, just to be inspired by them and wanting to be that person later on in life. Taking over the lineup. Katie Simmers, Stephanie Gilmore, Joanne DeFay, Sarah Bonk, they're all out there pushing these girls, encouraging them. Anytime the GOAT is teaching you anything, these girls just had the biggest smiles. Are you having a lot of fun? Yeah. Yes, we definitely plan to be on the championship tour one day. If we keep on working hard, we'll get there. Yeah, this is the best part about what we do. Spread the love. Just cannot wipe the smile off of my face watching that piece, being out there in the water with those girls. It's just contagious. Every single time you just feel the energy of them and that realization of, yes, I can do this because I've had this opportunity. It's a really, really cool thing. So honored to be a part of Rising Tides. And as we look ahead to the Surfline forecast, Pete, do we have some rising swell coming well, our way? This has been on the maps since uh, we got here. Pretty much this was the two days that we were looking at it. It's fudged one way or the other as far as the forecasting is going. But yes, we're gonna supposed to have some six to eight foot, six to 10 foot by the afternoon, drop off and then come back up again for Thursday. The winds offshore, mm. pretty much gonna be howling on uh, Wednesday as we see that the winds are very strong, but uh, that does also keeps the waves up and it's offshore, so it's all good. Thursday, a little bit of an opportunity there for the morning, but it's supposed to turn on shore. So we still have time and there's, uh, you know, as many heats as we have to get done. Um, we may look at overlapping as, a, as an option. So um, there is options there to get us done early. Let's look ahead at some of those heats that we still have because some massive names, especially when you start talking about the Rip Curl Final Five in just two events away. We have some really important moments like this one, for example, men's elimination round heat number one. Ethan Ewing against Aiden Messenkamp, who's the wild card here in South Africa. Paul, we saw what Sarah Baum was able to do today. Ethan trying to punch his ticket to Trestles. This is a big one. Two surfers with an incredible relationship with this way. Of course, Ian, uh, sorry, uh, Ethan just proving last year that that relationship that we've been talking about throughout is very up and coming career, sort of consummated that relationship with the win here. Aiden Massenkamp's been surfing this place basically his whole life. 
He looked, didn't look great in the opening rounds. We saw him warming up. He looked amazing. I'm sure he'll be back with uh, a sharp blade whenever that happens. So that's one of the big ones. And then let's look at heat number three in the elimination round, Pete, because it has Kelly Slater and Jack Robinson. Yeah, it's almost uh, similar to the, what we just saw the Wimbledon final, uh, <laughs> which is uh, you got the GOAT, obviously, Djokovic, Kelly Slater, and Jack Robinson, Alcaraz. I mean, this was a great matchup. This is the first one that popped out to me in this elimination round. Kelly's going to be motivated because of Jack. I um, mean, you know, these guys have known each other since Jack was basically showing up in the North Shore, very early age. <laughs> yeah, a little extra spice in this one as well. Jack Robinson, bit of a shocker from him, the late part of the season. He's had a nightmare through events and he just want to get back to that early season form this year what he had going last year he'll want it back and what a way to do it what a statement to make yeah jack robinson having that injury that threw him off a little bit in the mid part of the year so peter how important is it for him to go pretty far oh, here in JB? it's 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 mandatory yeah. it really is and he knows it which is added pressure right i mean that's the whole thing kelly on the other hand um you know he just wants to put a good performance in um you know, he's, it's, he's not going to back down to, to Jack, but it is very important for Jack. If he wants a final five berth, he's got to compete and get well all the way into the quarterfinals. Probably semis would help. Massive, massive moments coming your way from Jeffries Bay, but the call is off for today. So tomorrow is going to be our next look at it. Make sure to be tuned into WorldSurfLeague.com for the very latest. And until then, enjoy the highlights from today. Happy to get some work done with the opening round for the women. I love skipping that round. It's the best feeling ever. Are you kidding? And the wild card gets the win. She sent world number one into the elimination round. This copyrighted event broadcast is produced by the World Surf League for broadcast around the world and may not be retransmitted, reproduced, rebroadcast, or otherwise distributed or used in any form without the written consent of the World Surf League.